of all, Lord. Thank you for making America great again. No surprises. Welcome, it's Thursday, May 31st, 2018. Welcome to Raging Chickens Out to Coop Podcast. It's a special Thirsty Thursday edition in honor of the summer just around the corner and a whole bunch of scheduling craziness going on. This is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. Each week I talk to our capital muckraker in chief, Sean Kitchen, about the good, the bad, and the ugly in state and national politics. On this week's show... It's Roseanne! <laughs> Fired for popping off a racist tweet over the weekend. She said she was on Ambient, can't help it. The Ambient drug maker says, well, racism is not a known side effect of taking their product. <laughs> okay. Donald Trump goes on a pardon palooza. Dun, dun, dun. Issued pardon for Dinesh D'Souza, the freaking guy who's... Yeah, we'll get into that. And pardons commutations for Martha Stewart and Rod Blagojevich. <laughs> North Korea summit on or off? We don't know. Trump signs the right to try drug legislation. So, you know, sign away your right to die. Dick Sporting Goods says that ending sales of assault weapons has not really hurt its sales as expected. <laughs> All the hedge funds jump back on dicks. <laughs> Did you get that? <laughs> <laughs> Recent Supreme Court ruling that prevents workers from joining in class action lawsuits. If they sign the force arbitration clause, remember that we talked about that. Well, it's already smacking down Chipotle workers. That's right. Almost immediately after the Supreme Court rules. Tens of thousands. 10,000 plus Chipotle workers are going to get hit. Ireland votes overwhelmingly to end abortion. Right there, Catholic Church. 66%. Abortion ban. Abortion ban. What did I say? Abortion. Abortion. End abortion ban. My bad. My bad. I was so excited. It's my home country. <laughs> Federal Reserve votes to ease regulations on the big banks. Setting the stage for the next financial meltdown. We just don't learn, people. And Tom Perez, remember this whole thing about elections have consequences? Remember the whole thing when Tom Perez was running against Keith Ellison? Remember the whole thing? Well, there you go. Tom Perez pisses off progressives by endorsing Mario Cuomo. <laughs> Gotta keep it in the freaking family. Not, my... Not Mario. Not Mario. Andrew. Sorry. Man, you are off your game tonight. I am off my game. I was supposed to be working on the compressor tonight, not doing a damn podcast. But here we are, and we are doing it while imbibing. So, Hey, I'm the one that just stumbled out of the bar. You're right. I didn't. I have to catch up. In Pennsylvania news, Scott Wagner, he's going to resign for the Senate June 4th. To put all his attention towards becoming the next governor. Got to become the next governor. Go play with your spidget finner. That's what he's really going to be doing. Sean went to the raise the wage demo today. Legislators were on break, but it was a pretty good turnout. And pushing for a minimum wage. Maybe we should be pushing for a higher one. I don't know. Tomorrow, the reason why we're not going to be doing the podcast tomorrow, uh, I have in the afternoon, I have a, uh, uh, I'm going to be at my daughter's school for their celebration, or celebration um, end of the year, and Sean is going to be at Lou Barletta's press conference in the Rotunda. Who Our knows what's going to happen? Control and school safety. <laughs> there you this go. Be a fucking bar burner. <laughs> Buckets of rocks, man. Buckets of rocks. <laughs> I wonder Just if they're actually gonna, they're going to hand out buckets of rocks to go up to the third floor to demonstrate the effectivity of their new strategy. <laughs> <laughs> and we've got an unusually big segment three tonight, folks. Sean has watched Star Wars. We're going to talk about that for an hour. <laughs> Not really. But he did watch Star Wars. It's pretty cool. Sean also picked up some awesome art this week. Uh, you may have seen some of the pictures of his uh, very, very nicely placed artwork on his walls. 
if you have access to Sean's personal channels, that is. Sean is now looking to sell some of his own prints, which, if you've seen any of his photography, is awesome. They're awesome. I mean, seriously. And we're going to do whatever we can, right, to basically <laughs> promote Sean's <laughs> work right here. <laughs> I just had to say it. Uh, but in space news or tech news, well, working for Elon Musk is hell, according to the Daily Beast article. Jeff Bezos, we talked about this on the show last week, folks. This is the follow-up. He does come through and save The Expanse, the series The Expanse. And he used that same opportunity to lay out his plans for the moon base. <laughs> there you go, folks. First and if, down. Well, and if you think this is crazy, Wilbur Ross, Wilbur Ross, you remember the Secretary of Commerce, Wilbur Ross, we've, he's been on this show before. We've been talking about him in terms of space news. Well, he just something, this is published on whitehouse.gov, basically saying moon base will be a reality sooner than you think. That's going to be a fun one. Free Wheel, thank God for Free Wheel tonight, man, that we're going tonight because they had a new can release. They Judo financing. Oh, my God, it's so good. Um, but their Free Wheel is also now stocked up with a whole bunch of new stuff and new can stuff. Micromanager and their House Pilsner duct tape and zip ties, which is fantastic. We'll get into that. And on the downside of things, Hill Farmstead owner Sean Hill goes on the record about alcohol and mental health issues in the craft beer industry. And then he blames a journalist for reporting the interview. Like, I don't know what the hell he thinks an interview is, but there you go. Oops. I remind everybody, tune in to the Rick Smith Show on Free Speech TV this and every Saturday at 7 p.m. Eastern. You can also uh, you can stream the show live at freespeech.org. You can also tune in on the Dish Network, DirecTV, or through the Free Speech TV app on Roku. If you missed the show, just go to richmithshow.com and click on the Free Speech TV icon in the sidebar or go directly to freespeech.org and go through the archives. Special shout-out to our latest member, Chris, who joined at the eight, the, the eight, the $5 a month level. Thank you so much, Chris. Fantastic. Man, I'll tell you, it's, it's you know, every time we get a member, it is so encouraging. I can't tell you, especially after and one of these days when I was spent, I spent the bulk of my day going through the finance stuff for Raging Chicken, trying to make sure that we're going to be kind of positioned and well positioned uh, uh, for 2018 and then for 2020. Um, and then to have a member kind of join it, five bucks a month, man, amazing. And like, be like Chris, man. I'll tell you this. Be like Chris. Support Pull No Punches Progressive Media. Become a member of Raging Chicken for as little as 5 bucks a month. Simply go to patreon.com slash rcpress and choose your membership level. And if you're not ready to become a member, no problem. You can make a one-time donation by going to ragingchickenpress.org and click on the support and membership tab and then click donate and you're good to go. And pretty soon... Um, I'm not sure when this is going to drop, but pretty soon we're going to have a, a direct button where you can actually just donate directly on the web page. You don't have to go through these multiple links. Um, that's coming soon for, uh, soon for Look For That. It's the kind of thing that you can share with your friends um, so you can help build this up. Man. So, Sean, man, welcome to Thirsty Thursday. I know. How's everything going? Uh, yeah, it's going well. It's uh, Right now, it's officially 9.54 p.m., uh, here on the East Coast, <laughs> because everyone is really listening out in California right now. Um, they'll get Those this right after dinner. What's that? Those three hours make a big difference. They make a big difference. Uh, big yeah, like league. I said, bigly. what's that? I said bigly. 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 Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, so Sean's got, got something in the Capitol tomorrow, um, and I've got a kind of uh, – I had a tight kind of – you know, deadline for when, when I had to get out of here to get to my daughter's school, um, my daughter and son's school, but it's a special event for my daughter, fair end of year stuff. Um, so we're doing a Thursday, Thursday night. And I, I, I like the idea. Sean had to basically say, yeah, we do this more often, you know, it's summertime, you know, get together on a Thursday night, a little bit more relaxed, right? Um, yeah, we're going to do some more of that. What do you yeah. think? I w- uh, yeah. So uh, I went home this weekend. Yes, you did. For the first time on the holiday weekend in about uh, three years, because, uh, you know, I am not working as a bartender anymore. Yeah, normally you worked at some place that you had obligations during that time. Yeah, um, but no, I, I was home. Yeah. 
I, <laughs> I was home all over the weekend. I actually had a fun time being, you know, home for the for the weekend. Yeah, but it was nice. Did you guys do a cookout and stuff with my niece? Yeah, did you do a cookout and stuff? Yeah, we had a cookout. Uh, we spent some time with my niece. You know, she's uh, going to be two in July. Yeah, she's got to be running around like crazy right now, right? Yes, she's running around, and she's also she's at the point where uh, she's been at that point where she can't talk. But she can communicate. Yeah. So, um, like, a couple awesome. of things, like, she, like, when she wants to take off her shoes or something like that, she knows how to take her shoes off, take the socks off, and place them in that designated spot where the shoes and socks go. And, like, so I asked her, I was like, you need help putting your shoes on? Because she went, she ran into the bedroom the other day while I was, like, laying down watching TV and in, like, the common, I guess, like, in the guest bedroom now, which is, used to be my bedroom. <laughs> And so she's kind of like looking at me with her sandals in her hand. And I'm like, do you need help with that? And she goes, no. And just ran out with the sandals <laughs> into uh, my mom, into the, the living room and have my mom uh, put the sandals on. <laughs> she's like thinking like, hey, do I really, uh, am I gonna ready to trust this guy? I don't know. <laughs> but the funny thing is like, as we were leaving for my cousin's uh, 30th birthday party, um, she's running around and everything. Like, as we're walking out the door, she's, like, stopping and, like, looking at me, making sure I'm leaving with them. Oh, that's awesome. And then, uh, you know, I'm, I'm messing around with her. I'm teasing her. And uh, my mom calls me uh, Uncle Butch, which is, like, the crazy uncle in the family. She's like, <laughs> God, you're such an ass. You're such an ass like Uncle Butch because I was teasing her. She was crying. It's like, oh, cry, baby, cry, baby, cry, baby. Like, making a little fun of her and, like, picking her up and everything. She's like, you're just like Uncle Butch. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I had some fun uh, over the uh, Memorial Day weekend. Awesome. Well, I'll tell you, you know, you weren't the only one having fun this weekend. Uh, apparently, somebody was popping some Ambien and uh, and having a blast getting back to the way things used to be. <laughs> no, the way things are now since Donald Trump is president. Very, very uh, apt correction there, Sean. Yeah. And, you know, so like this whole entire thing, obviously, everyone knows what happened with Roseanne Barr over the weekend. As soon as I saw the tweet, um, I was like, yeah, she's done. There's just no way her TV show is staying on there. But um, the thing is, it's like two things about this. One, the response was fast and swift from activists out there yep. um, threatening advertisers. And I believe in the age of the Parkland shooting, um, they have the student activists from the Parkland, the survivors from Parkland, have provided a roadmap for progressives to just fucking take it to advertisers of these people. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I believe ABC was so fast to drop this TV show. And it shows you that it is convenient for them to drop races, a racist person, even though she has a history of being racist and making extremely racial insensitive tweets and actions out right. there. Right. I mean, once like they brought Roseanne back on TV, they knew what they were getting. Right. There was a history of Roseanne out there with her making racist issues, calling Susan Rice an ape. She did that years ago, but it became convenient for them to fire her when they saw their advertisers, uh, the threat, the threats of their advertising dollars going up in smoke and flames. Well, you know, it's really interesting. You could see and, because because in part because of the way that the media narrative was constructed about about um, Trump's win, you could see some of these like executives like, look, all they care about is Mike making making like boatloads of cash. Right. I mean, so that that's where their commitments at. And so you could see them after the Trump victory and after the kind of the Trump phenomenon, really being like, yeah, this might actually work for our ratings because there's obviously a lot of people out there that really want to hear this stuff. Um, and so, you know, they, they took a gamble on this. But, you know, again, we see where the where the power is lying on these. And it also shows you, know, you that this stuff will not be tolerated in the age of Trump, yeah. even though he has empowered people to speak like this freely. Um you know, one of the things when we were working with Rick, Rick was saying, no, these things have been said by people for years. This isn't anything new, what Roseanne Barr is saying. Roseanne Barr is saying what the old white dying men have been saying in country clubs and back rooms and smoke-filled rooms right. for years now. Right. Trump has only allowed, emboldened them to say this shit in public. Right. And this is what happened over the weekend. And um, the pushback was saying no. This stuff will not be tolerated. Right. And I have to say, you know, I, this, all kudos goes to I thought this was a pretty classy move. Um, I, I'm just I don't know the guy's name. I don't know if it was, the, it was the head of ABC or the head of Disney. 
who actually uh, called Valerie Jarrett, who was obviously you know the target of Roseanne um, Roseanne Barr's tweet, uh, the racist tweet, um, called her before, right? Canceled the show and let her know that this is not going to be tolerated and the show is going to be canceled. And I thought that was actually a pretty a, a pretty cool move on their part. Um, I also thought it was a pretty cool move, and this also is like you know when you test the waters out there. When Roseanne Barr said that the reason why she was being racist was because she had popped the Ambien and she shouldn't have been tweeting while on Ambien. The fact that like a Sanofi US who is produces Ambien actually sent out like like a tweet that basically said, uh, "Well, <laughs> let's you know, racism is not a known side effect of Ambien." Sorry, Roseanne. Um, I and mean, that was pretty freaking awesome too, as well. Which also tells you where the, you know these people are looking at where their bread is buttered, and they're saying it's not with the Roseanne bars of the world. Yeah. Um. And no, I mean, do you expect anything else? I don't know if this is true or not, but I think the you know, the Trump administration might be offering her a uh, position within the can. I don't know. I, you're you're not. This is a, this is total fake news right now. <laughs> Please tell me this is fake news. <laughs> so I saw this on a Sarah Huckabee Sanders Facebook page. Oh my god! That had like a White House page that had like thirty thousand people following it, and looked like it could pass off as a. I don't know if this was satire or not. I have to look into this, but I mean, like the Trump, it seems like Trump is like still a fan of Roseanne Barr. Yeah. Well, duh. (laughs) But no, I mean like, and this all goes back to Charlottesville. Like, of course he's not going to come out and say anything in the, in the wake of this. I mean, he fucking supported Nazis over the summer. Right. Right. So yeah. 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 Uh, well, you know, I guess I, I, I would say there, there there are some people I feel bad for about this. Uh, the union workers who produced the show and the, uh, the other people who had lost those paychecks because of uh, Roseanne Barr. Well, you, you know what? You know what would be really interesting right now is like because like, look, you know, the one thing about about Roseanne, like the original show, like it was one of the few shows that was on. There was actually kind of like had a working class family portrayed like at, at the center of the show right back in the day not this recent one right i love the the ed bundy not or wait family the bundies what the bundies married with children married with children yes that's what that's the one Al that you bundy. liked that's what you liked you liked the guy with his hand in his pants that's who's the guy that you like <laughs> that's why i grew up watching okay fuck you <laughs> god you've come a long way baby <laughs> 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 But I mean, I mean, so when it came out, it was like that. And the thing is, is like, you know, I look, this is not going to happen. But imagine, just imagine if they took this opportunity to say, okay, we tried the Trump working class stuff. Let's try the Bernie Sanders working class stuff and see where we get with that. Right. I mean, that'd be like John Goodman leaves Roseanne on the show. Right. Decides that's it. We're done. I've put up enough of this crap of this Trump stuff. You've, you've gone against everything and he leaves. Right. And then it takes on a whole Bernie Sanders move, right? Because, like, you know, their kid, right? I'm forgetting all their names now, but the, um, their kid was, you know, she was a little lefty. Her sister, Roseanne's sister on the show, was, was you know, a feminist and things like this. Right? Why don't you just kind of turn the lens a little bit and give us that? That'd be kind of cool. But it's not going to happen. So, um, but, but good news, I guess, on the other side for Rod. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, what's up with this? Pardon Palooza, Who? Sean. Who? Uh, Rod Blazovic. <laughs> I, I, I don't remember him. Did, did he go to jail or something? He did. He did. He trying to sell like a Senate seat, right? Yeah, I he think, basically or... was doing a lot of the same kind of stuff that you find out going on in the Trump administration right now. That guy, <laughs> the guy that that Donald Trump could look at and see like, hey, it's like a freaking uh, brother, practically the brother from another <laughs> mother. This guy. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so what's I saw going a on with this? him today huh? on the computer, and he has like this cyan. His hair went from like brown to like cyan gray, like from being in prison. Obviously, for the past six years, um, <laughs> after trying to sell a senate, now he dyes his hair with blood. <laughs> <laughs> Someone asked if he was uh, using the uh, toilet. Um, the toilet cake says hair dye. Oh, God. My God. 
<laughs> oh man, what a fucking day for the Trump administration! I'll tell you that the pardon palooza. The pardon palooza. So he actually issued a pardon for Dinesh D'Souza. <laughs> yes, he did. Did you see that today? I did not. I was like <laughs> digging in the mud, and I was like doing like stuff on financial crap today, and one of the worst fucking human beings out there. He's horrible. When I was in college, he was horrible, and he's only gotten worse. <laughs> this guy was like the scourge of like you know. I mean, oh my god, he's he's a horrible human being. Let's put it and that. He gets a fucking... And he gets a pardon. And he gets a pardon. He gets a pardon. Pardon for you, pardon for you, and you, and you, and you. And Everybody you. gets a pardon. You say good things about me, I get <laughs> and you a pardon. Also, uh, Martha Stewart, uh, Trump is concerning to uh, commute her record. What is up with that? I got no fucking clue. <laughs> he's, he, he got something for Martha Stewart or something? I mean, I don't know. I mean, do they, have, do they know each other? I mean, I guess they, you know, they probably bumped into each other before. Just that. I don't know. Who knows? Whatever, man. This is this is what he can do. Did you actually hear? This is kind of a side note, right? It's kind of how it's going to go tonight, I guess. Um, but did you hear uh, Trump talking about the uh, about all the uh, economic victories that have been going on in the country? <laughs> in this little speech he gave, did you hear this? Uh, no, but did you see the tweet he put out over the over Memorial Day weekend? I did not. Uh, basically, saying that um, Happy Memorial Day. Unemployment in the African American community is at all time low. All this other stuff's at all time low. And then Roseanne Barr comes the next day and just oh god no. Well, here's well, this is the deal, right? He goes out and he's talking. He's he's on his way to kind of go meet with some of the victims of these school shootings, right? And uh, Michael Brooks did a great bit on the uh, uh, Majority Report on this today because he was basically saying that they ran the the audio from uh, uh, Trump, kind of you know talking about what he's you know. The, word, the trip he's about to go on, and he's going, and he's like, he literally sounded like, you know, as Michael Brooks put it, like the sound that, like, you know, or, or I think it was actually the other guy, Matt said, I think said this, but it's basically, it's like how you talk to your parents when you're coming home from school, right? He's like, yeah, the economy was good, it's got a really low unemployment level, like he was just kind of like, he's like, I'm so bored talking about this, and then he's going to go on, and he's going to go meet with some of the shooting victims, and then he says, yeah, so where did you know, the economy's doing great, so I got to get going, because like, we're, we got to go have some fun, <laughs> he's, going, he's going to meet with shooting victims, and he's going to go, he said he's going to go have some fun. Anyways, totally, totally off there. But that, that's you know, this is what you do. You give some pardons, and then you go have some fun with some shooting victims. <laughs> Nuts, man! It's crazy. So I'm sorry I missed the whole pardon palooza thing. Did you watch it live, Sean? Were you sitting I there on C-SPAN waiting for it to go? I kind of woke up at like uh, nine thirty this morning. Nine thirty. This happened before nine yeah. thirty. <laughs> No, but I think I saw the news like coming down the pipe. Oh my god, <sighs> crazy! So, what do you think? Uh, what are the odds on the North North Korea summit? I don't know. I think it's back on. It's back on. You think? I think so. I'm, I'm getting that fucking coin. I don't know, man. I want that coin. I actually looked it up. I tried to see see if there's any way to get one, and it's uh, there's no way to get one yet. Will I be able to get my invoice? <laughs> you can invoice the coin. Yeah, invoice the coin. I want the coin. You want the coin. I want the coin. There you go. Well, um, so we'll see. I mean, we'll see. I think the uh, you know this is going to be a game, and it's going to play the play out all over the course of the summer, right? It's going to go back and forth. It's going to be drama, and then in the end, we're going to end up pretty much the same place that we started, um, with some pretty words that are kind of like gloss on there. Uh, who knows? Uh, I'm still going to hold out. I want to see Trump in, like, you know, a Kim Jong-un haircut. That's what I want to see. <laughs> if we could get Trump in that haircut. You mean the wig? Do they make a wig like that? I, I, I hope so. They've got to. Somebody out there, please do it. Right? Uh, I think Dom Costa might be able to help. <laughs> Dom Costa. Man, could you imagine Trumpy Bear? Trumpy Bear with a Kim Jong-un wig? That'd be awesome. I think I might or have to Costa do that myself. Wig. <laughs> crazy crazy man um well in kind of a little bit more serious news that um there's been this this push for a while now but uh trump just signed on to this uh right to try drug legislation i don't know how much you filed any of this stuff sean no well this I was didn't even hear about it until today 
Well, the, the basically the going to write the try stuff is look. It's kind of like this. There's these, this is like a Lochner type of like write the contract for medical stuff. Uh, it's it's more like it's more like this, right? The idea here is that you know in order for a drug to make it to market. Right. It has to prove that it's not going to kill you. There's not going to be, you know, horrible side effects and that it actually does what it says it's going to do. Right. And it's a pretty rigorous process, but it takes a long time. So there's been people who are have, you know, kind of like significant, like, you know, serious illnesses. And there's a promising drug that that is seems, you know, be getting some kind of buzz about it. They want to be able to say we want to skip the whole process of kind of making sure that it's safe. And it's my personal right to try. If I want to put my body on the line and I want to go try that drug, I want to try that drug. So forget about all the kind of, um, you know, FDA, protections yeah. that are put into are, are put into place. I mean, it's not like anyone's working there right now. What's that? It's not like no one's working there. What do you mean? At the FDA and stuff like that. No, exactly. I mean, so you basically you have you basically We're gutting leaving- government. Right. I mean, you leave it you leave it to individuals to decide whether they want to kind of risk it or not. I mean, it's like it's like the worst case scenario. You know, maybe we should actually have a game show that we could see this going on. What do you think? You're right to try tonight. What do you got? You got cancer? What do you got? You got a tumor? What do you got? You got AIDS? Well, we got these three things. This is what the drug makers PR people say that they do. We don't know if they actually do them or not. Would you like your right to try? It's crazy, man. And it's kind of like, you know, and it plays off this narrative that the right has been so effective in in laying out about, like, my freedom, it's my freedom to do this stuff. When this is not the way things should be proceeding, right? I mean, you want to make sure that drugs are going to be safe that are going on the market. Um, but whatever, you know, there's policies and procedures, but so that's going to move forward to as well. So we'll see where that goes. I mean, this is kind of like, you know, the direction that we're all going. And then at the same time, so you got that right, that drug legislation, like that on the other side of flip side of stuff, it's not really a flip side at all. Really just different topic. Really (laughs) what Dick sporting goods. You see this stuff this week, Sean? No. I Man, I was, thought it was awesome. It was like, this is a CNBC, right? They kind of put out this thing and say, you know, Dick Sporting Goods basically made the decision um, after a bunch of these shootings, right, that they were going to stop um, selling assault weapons. No more AR-15s, no more assault weapons. They're pulling it out. And that's significant because Dick's is one of the kind of, you know, like, like biggest sellers, biggest sellers, biggest sellers of assault weapons or were, right, of guns, right, across the country. They're a huge chain. And they decided, look, we are not going to um, sell assault um, weapons anymore. And so... Here's today, right? This is, let me make sure this is today or was this yesterday? This was yesterday. Dick's Sporting Goods shares gained nearly 26% on Wednesday after it beat its first quarter expectations and hiked its full year earnings forecast. Right? Because in February, Dick stopped sell- selling all assault ru- uh, style rifles in stores following the school shooting in Parkland, Florida, which killed 17 students and staff members. And part of Wednesday's big move was likely had to do with hedge funds scrambling to cover their bets that will, uh, cover their bets against Dick stock. So basically, what they did, all these hedge funds and everything was they were betting on the fact that Dick's was going to kind of like like crash and burn. And they were going to go out of business on their huge bad earnings. Nope, not at all, not at all. So they find like, okay, yeah, we gave up those guns, and guess what? Didn't hurt our business model very much and at it all. Shows you the myth that <clears throat> um, gun owners are this monolithic voting, voting block within the country. When really, like, gun ownership has been dwindling um, in smaller and smaller number, numbers. Like, right. the, the number of people owning guns have been dwindling. It's just that they're buying all the guns around. Bingo. So it just shows you that this gun culture, this myth that we are a gun country is dying because gun ownership is going down. While the people buying, they're just buying the most guns. It's heavily concentrated to this small percentage of people in this country. Yep. Where, you know, we keep on working towards getting rid of guns. This will not be an issue. Right. Exactly. Right. Pretty straightforward. You know, the whole idea that the same people that that, that go that go to like dicks. Like 5% or 10% of Pennsylvanians actually own a gun. That's not a lot of people in Pennsylvania. No. 
it goes against that myth that we are like gun culture state with hunting and everything. No, exactly. I mean, it's the same kind of stuff. It's like, you know, it's like it shows you that the fact that the people that go to Dick's like to buy their kids like, you know, Running soccer shoes. cleats are not the soccer same people cleats. that are buying are buying like boatloads of assault weapons. <laughs> right. But you don't want an AR-15 with your kid's soccer cleats or shin guards? Yeah, well, I thought about it, but then I actually did that. I actually went out and bought cleats for my daughter at Dick's, right? And I went – actually, I went to Dick's in particular, right, because of their decision. I was looking at different places. Ah, you know what? I'm going to go there because they banned the assault So you went to the Dick's down by the Willow Grove Mall? No, no. I went to the one in Lehigh Valley. Okay. I'm tied to the Lehigh Valley, man. I love the Lehigh Valley. I go up there. Right. Just saying. Okay. <clears throat> so that's good news, right? Um, on the bad news things, if we're going to go up and down on here. So uh, you remember the su- recent Supreme Court ruling, um, which came down, let's see, uh, earlier last, Monday, right? On last Monday or this Monday, last Monday. A week so, and a half ago. So, okay, ago. so the Supreme Court issued, and this is from, this is coming out of, um, uh, where are we talking about? This is coming from Huffington Post, right? Um, so Chipotle, right, um, has basically asked the court, right, to exclude 2,814 workers from a massive wage theft lawsuit because they signed mandatory arbitration agreements, all right? Now, this would not have happened had it not been from Supreme Court decision Right. That basically just recently ruled. Right. This decision was in Epic Systems versus Lewis. Right. That was basically saying that if workers signed uh, a, like an arbitration agreement, like as a kind of condition of employment. Right. They basically were giving up their right to sue even as a, a class action suit um, in court. As we talked about in the podcast before, the reason why this is important is because if you're getting robbed like by five bucks a week. Right. As an individual. Right. And you're making minimum wage. You don't have a whole lot of money to go out and hire a high, you know, a high power lawyer. Right. In order to get that five bucks back. Right. You're going to spend more on the lawyer than you would. So you just give up. So you band together in class action. Basically say we got to hold this company accountable. And so because of the Supreme Court, because of elections have consequences, Neil Gorsuch, who wrote the opinion, basically says, nope, you guys don't get to do that anymore. You have to do it individually. Right. So here we go. So now for a few thousand current and former Chipotle workers, right, the effects are going to be of that are going to be felt immediately. And this is again Huffington Post, quote, roughly 10,000 people who have worked for the burrito chain joined a 2014 lawsuit alleging the company systematically forced them to work off the clock. They claim that Chipotle gives its restaurants so little payroll that managers require employees to clock out and continue working or perform work before they clock in. They're suing to recoup the money that the claim Chipotle, uh, they claim Chipotle owes them for the uncompensated work. But Chipotle has been arguing that 2,814 workers in that group do not have a valid claim because they signed class and collective action waivers when they accepted their job. Late last year, the company provided the court with a 62-page list of workers in the lawsuit who had supposedly signed away their rights and asked a judge to exclude them from the proceedings. So now we've got another case of workers being screwed out of their rights because of the Supreme Court, right? And if this case goes through and they get kicked off, they're long, not like allowed to pursue this any further. You know what's going to happen? Every company like this is going to jump on. Every company. Shocking. Right? Should be fun. Living in the Blade Runner world that we'll be living in. Pretty crazy. And now back up on the on the roller coaster, Ireland votes overwhelmingly to end the abortion ban. Woo! My home country, man. My home country. <clears throat> Your heritage. Uh, yeah. Well, that was pretty cool. Do you see? Because the way that Ireland's like like citizenship. It's like or, people were flying in from around yeah, the world. Exactly. To go home and vote for this. It was amazing. Yeah. No. Um. And then a couple of the bishops in Ireland said that if you voted yes. To uh, remove, repeal the abortion ban, you have to sin and must go to confession. Yeah, well, I guess there was a big flying middle finger salute that went to all of them folks. Right? Because, I mean, you know, th- th- this is the whole it just, thing. It, it amazes me how, like, Catholics are still stuck up on this issue. And this is a huge issue for Catholics. 
and I was thinking about this the other day. Like, I mean, this is just like a. And this is an issue for Catholics and like Catholics in our legislature. And they force this issue upon everyone else, even though this is an issue that has nothing to do with them getting reelected or not. This is a personal religious issue that they force upon people uh, within our legislature. You have a bunch of pro-life Catholics in there who are in safe, safe democratic seats. Yep, and uh, they force the abortion issue on people because of their religion, and um, they don't believe that um, their religion and their choices that they make in the legislature should be separated. Yep, you know, again, like I, I've said for a long, long time, right? Is like, look, if you personally believe, right, you are like committed to for religious reasons, whatever it means that that you should not have an abortion, right? Have at it, <laughs> right? You can believe that. You know, I actually have. You know, I have. I have some people I know, right, that are you know kind of live around live around by me, who are, you know, they lost the kid, right? They lost the kid, right, and they knew they're going to lose the kid. But um, you know what? Um, they believe that stuff, right? They believe that like this is this is a life, and we're going to take the life and all that kind of stuff. And I'd be the last person on the planet to, like, sit there and say, okay, you know, like, to look down upon anybody like this or anything like that. Not at all. Right? And, like, I respect the fact that they've got those things. And if they, if it's not forced on a woman, if it's, like, it's her beliefs, and she, have at it. But exactly it. Is like, then this is what has been the case in Ireland, right? It's been the standout, right, in Western democracies, um, like, for, gener like, generations, right? And you know, and what they and everyone said that no, because of the Catholic Church, because of the Catholic Church, it could never pass. And you know, there's a Prime Minister Leo uh, Varadkar, I think, right? Basically said um, said this way at one of the counting centers in Dublin, right? He basically said, quote, "What we have seen today really is a culmination of a quiet revolution that has been taking place in Ireland for the past ten to twenty years," and it's absolutely true. Women, especially. Right. Saying, you know, you might sit there and kind of nod their head when it comes to hearing what the Catholics have to say. But in the meantime, they're organizing against this to get rid of this ban. And 66 percent right, voted to end the abortion ban in Ireland. And that was just huge. Absolutely huge. Yeah. So kudos to folks there. Uh, OK, I, I, I'm getting tired of this stuff. But <laughs> the Federal Reserve, I got to mention this because the Federal Reserve uh, when I read this story, this story was, uh, you know, this came from the Washington Post. And um, when I saw this, I just didn't know what to do. This, kid, this article published yesterday in the Washington Post, Federal Reserve votes to ease rule, a rule it aimed at preventing big, ba big banks from making risky financial bets. So basically, the short of it is, is that here we have once again, say it with me, everybody, elections have consequences, that basically we're deregulating all the big banks removing all those kind of like strictures on these big banks that um were were put in place to prevent the kind of economic collapse that we saw in 2008 and 2009 and gloves are off chains are off free market's going to rain and so I'm just going to I'm just I'm seriously, I think we should start taking bets on when how soon the next financial but, collapse is going to come. Can I tell you something real quick? Please do. <clears throat> Jill Stein would not have done this. Jill Stein. Why Jill didn't Stein. people vote for Jill Stein, Sean? I know. Why not? Jill Stein wouldn't have done this. She would not have done this. She would not have done this. <laughs> Got that, everybody? <laughs> Elections have consequences. Elections have consequences. And let's I'll tell you something. Chris. <laughs> and let's just say, let's just say, right, that like as cozy as the Clintons are with Wall Street, right, I could guarantee you Hillary Clinton would not have done this. Right? I don't know. I, I, I don't know. People were telling me she's just as bad as Trump the whole entire time. Yeah, well, you know what? Here you go, folks. You got your wish. You thought, you know, you get, you're sitting there, you're kind of like, you got your kind of like Jimmy Dore playlist going on, kind of like, you know, constant play and repeat. 
hearing him say that yes, this is going to bring about Trump is actually going to be good because Trump is going to bring this going to bring the revelation. It's going to bring end times. It's yeah, there you go. The here you go. Everything's going to be great after that. Yeah, yeah. Well, here you go. And meanwhile, we're going to find out that we're, we're headed towards the brink of the next economic catastrophe. And like you know, again, I've heard. Look, I've heard and everyone saw this coming. <sighs> Everyone saw this coming. This, is, this, drives, this drives me fucking crazy, man. <laughs> it drives me crazy. It drives me crazy because it's like, you know, look. I, I had, look, there was a time in my life, I'll say this, right? There was a time in my life which I had much more kind of dogmatic beliefs. I'll use that word, right? I wouldn't have thought them about, about them as dogmatic at the time. Um, but I would have said things like, look, the Democrats... Right, are are kind of are no good, and I'm not going to vote Democrat. But I have to say, there's only been one time. There's been only one time when it came down to actually kind of voting, uh, one time in my life that I did not vote for a Democrat. And you, you know who that was for? Who? The giant sucking sound. <laughs> was, you voted for Ross Perot. I voted for Ross Perot. <clears throat> right, I voted for Ross Perot. I was young. I was naive. But there was – I voted out of anger. So, I mean, I understand – like, I, and I remember why I voted that way. It was everything to do with NAFTA. It had to do with NAFTA, right? And as, and as, as misguided as that – well, look, in the end, it didn't matter, right? Um, in the end, it didn't matter what, what that, that vote in that particular instance, right? Um, but this is, this, this is the same kind of thing. And, you know, I look at it now, and it's like – I was making the mistake that so many people in this last election made, um, you know, the idea that somehow I'm voting my vote. My vote is some sort of expression of my personal essence and my moral core. And I have to keep that intact and pure. Right. That's not what voting freaking is, people. Voting is a pragmatic thing that you do. You make the best choice that you can. And when are you going to have leverage? If you start organizing, you think about freaking power Instead of your your precious little moral core, you're going to come to different conclusions. You're going to say that the arc of history is made through sweat and blood and compromise and the dirty hands, not the pure hands. The pure hands are for the freaking people who go up on the mountaintop and stay in their damn beehive houses. Go be a monk. That is not the realm of politics, folks. The realm of politics requires impure acts. And that's what it is. And I look at, I'm telling you, I look at those Chipotle workers, that Chipotle case, clearly a company Janice. that is, well, Janice coming, right? But I look at, I mean, I, literally, the Chipotle case is like those workers are being screwed out of money. Chipotle is breaking the law. They are robbing workers. And what is happening? Because of freaking Neil Gorsuch, election have consequences Gorsuch, those workers are going to be screwed. So don't give me your kind of like, Jill Stein. Screw that, man. Hey, but there's going to be a guy running for governor. His name's Paul Glover. Don't and even, man. he's going to stop fracking and all that in the state, and he's going to yeah. he's 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 going to save us from Scott Wagner. I bet he will. Yep. yep. I bet he will. That 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 that's what I've been told. Well, you know, uh... <laughs> you're going to the jail. That's all I can say. <laughs> I heard that that's clip a felony also like five thousand <laughs> times over the weekend when I was home. Oh, really? Yes. So uh, one of the things I want to go on a tangent. Yeah. Um, like MSNBC spent like an hour on two, the, the day like the Roseanne Barr story broke and she got fired and shit can and stuff like that. They were spending like a first half hour was talking about Roseanne Barr and how racist she was and how bad it is and so bad for uh, society and stuff like this. And you know what's up the next fucking segment? Please do tell. They have someone on from the Center for Immigration Studies on. Which is a racist fucking organization started by this guy named John Tanton. Tanton is responsible for starting FAIR, the FAIR group that uh, 
Metcalf is a part of, Lou Barlow is a part of, this guy who is anti-immigrant and who's a flat out like eugenicist. And they're talking about like how racist this guy is and how bad it is and you're going to and the whole entire time they're playing like you're going to jail. <laughs> like you're going to be prosecuted. See that? You're and the whole entire time it's like, like as they're talking about how bad Roseanne Barr is, they have this lady on from the Center for Immigration Studies, which is one of the most racist anti immigrant organizations out there. They give credence to these people by just putting them on TV. And it's started by a person named John Tanton who is a flat out eugenicist. You you know who I'm talking about, right? Yeah, Tanton. yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's like this guy is, is he he's like a eugenicist going back to like 1978, 1979 when he started these groups. And this is like what these groups. Yeah, the, the, as soon as I heard this, it, it tri- I'm sorry, it triggered me a little bit. But like, this is like, <laughs> there you go, man. There you go. But like, no, the, the, I had to get off. I had, I had to get that, that was like one thing I got off my chest. Here you have this person. Yeah, it, it, it's like, oh, yeah, Roseanne Barr is a racist. And next up on the segment, we'll talk to someone from the uh, Center for Immigration Studies. (laughs) There you go. Oh, my God. (laughs) Oh, boy. Oh, man. I guess we're on that kind of road, folks, tonight. Yep. Um, So I think, you know, on this kind of a related note, um, I've got to, before we go to the next segment, before we take a break, um, I've got to just point out um, Tom Perez, man. Um, Tom Perez, after saying, not stepping in people's primaries, right? That's right. After he said, you know, look, well, you know, we don't. We're, we're, we're going to stay independent from people's primaries. We're not going to get involved in these fights between Democrats and the primary process. We're, we're, we're going to be completely independent, right? That same guy. Am I am, am I mistaken? That is that same guy. It's a, a matter of fact. It's exactly the same guy, <laughs> right? Okay. Is like you know, he's a Democratic national. This is uh, you know, this is oh god, this is coming out of Politico. Right. Um, Here's their lead on it. Democratic National Committee Chairman Tom Perez has said repeatedly, not once, repeatedly that the National Party shouldn't and won't endorse in primaries. But (laughs) last Thursday, he stood on Long Island stage and endorsed Andrew Cuomo, the New York governor who is facing a challenge from actress Cynthia Nixon. So Democrats, are you really trying to drive people away from the party and basically say, no, we don't want you to come out and vote for Democrats. We want you to vote for Jill Stein again. <laughs> right? This is what you're doing. I, this is blows my mind. Blows my mind. And so now, you know, and again, this is, and you know, I, 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 this baffles, baffles my mind about why the hell Perez would go out and do this. It just doesn't make any sense doesn't make any sense whatever man you know and this kind of thing feels kind of close to me too as well because new york like i mean you know i said in the intro about mario cuomo right because i when i grew up mario cuomo was our governor in new york right and and you know again i, I actually growing up i had a favorable idea i fit favorable like impression of that guy right and again i know now like from you know now older and i read more about stuff like that the guy was you know Guy was a little uh, too close to the, uh, you know, the Wagner types, the garbage collectors, and things like this, you know. But you know, he did. He he had that. He got shit done. He got shit done. Andrew Cuomo is not that guy. Andrew Cuomo is the kind of like you know the centrist corporate Democrat that kind of like is a political. He's politically savvy. I give him that, and he looks to find out where the wind is blowing and all that kind of stuff, and then he will use threats, right. In order, like threats, in order to kind of advance his own political career, kneecap and unions and stuff like that. Yeah, and this is what he did. This is what he did with the whole Working Families Party, right? The whole Working Families Party basically, there's a split in New York, right, over the Working Families Party, a party um, endorsement of Cynthia Nixon, right? Because of the labor unions left Working uh, Working Families Party after that, in part because Cuomo, right, reportedly. Like made some threats or some suggestions that there could be consequences if the if the working families families party and the unions that supported that party um, supported Cynthia Nixon, there might be consequences. So they pulled out, right? And then here you go again. Now you got freaking Tom Perez going on down there, basically. And look, I like Tom Perez. I think he's got some good he's got some good policy stuff. I would rather have Keith Ellison in there. I could guarantee you this. If Keith Ellison had won that election for the DNC, Keith Ellison would not be on some Long Island stage saying, 
We want Andrew Cuomo. <laughs> that would not happen. That would not happen. So I'm just saying, man. I was a little ahead of my break. Sorry. <laughs> I'm just saying now that was that was me telling myself I need to stop and we need to move on. <laughs> but uh, I don't know, Sean. I I don't know. You know, it's like just when just when we're kind of gearing up to kind of see some really positive stuff for the past the primaries that we've seen over the past several weeks, um, you get the DNC just kind of repeating the same unforced errors that it has done again and again and again. Jill Stein, 2020. Yep. <laughs> Here you go. I got my lawn sign out. There you go. All right. All right. Skip this is the Fetterman sign. Yeah, I'll stick with my Fetterman sign. How about that? I got my Fetter Fetterman sign. I'm gonna have my ser- you know that's what I should do. It's on my front lawn. Even I can't vote for these people in my district, but I'll have my my my, my Sarah in a Morado sign. I'll have my Summer Lee sign. Right. I'll have my Elizabeth Elizabeth uh, um, Fielder sign. Um, you know, just and then nice big rows for the. Uh, Democratic Socialists of America. DSA, man. DSA. All right. So anyways, uh, this is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. I want to remind you that this is a special Thursday, Thursday edition, like in anticipation of the summer that is to come, um, of Raging Chicken Press Out to Coop podcast. I want to remember you to become a member of Raging Chicken for as little as five bucks a month. Just go to patreon.com slash rcpress. Become a member today. We need you, folks. We need you. We'll be back right after this quick break. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1921. That was the day one of the worst race riots in American history began in Tulsa, Oklahoma. In a frenzy of anti-black violence, a white mob destroyed virtually the entire black neighborhood of Greenwood. Over the course of the next two days, as many as 300 mostly black residents were killed. Black Wall Street had been burned to the ground, leaving 10,000 homeless. The day before, Dick Rowland, a young black man, tripped as he boarded an elevator at his job. He fell against the young white woman elevator operator. When she shrieked, nearby department store employees assumed she had been assaulted. Roland was arrested and newspapers fanned the flames of race violence and vigilantism. And on this day, white racist mobs surrounded the Tulsa County Courthouse where Roland was being held and demanded he be turned over to them. Returning black veterans had become increasingly assertive about their rights as citizens. They marched to the courthouse armed in an attempt to prevent Roland's lynching. When the vets refused to disarm in the face of the demands by the white mob, gunfire ensued, touching off 16 hours of fighting that literally decimated the community black workers and professionals had built up over the course of decades. The National Guard was called out, mainly to disarm and round up black residents of Greenwood. Witnesses reported that Greenwood was bombed from the air by police and by Sinclair Oil Company planes. The history of the riot was buried for more than half a century. It would take until 1997 for the Oklahoma State Legislature to set up a commission to uncover the bloody details, which produced a 200-plus page report and recommended millions in reparations. Labor History in Two, brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and The Rick Smith Show. That's right, Mr. Fancy Pants himself is taking himself out of the state Senate in order to dedicate all of his efforts and all of his trash know-how to his run for governor. Sean, what's going on, man? Um, Scott Wagner's going to resign on Monday. Oh, my God. What is up with that? No fucking clue. <laughs> <laughs> no one knows why he's resigning, actually. Um it, I guess it just goes to show you he's not up for doing the job, so he hates doing a job he in government, but he wants a more important job in government. I just found it so weird. Yeah. 
everyone everyone's kind of like scratching their heads over this. All right, so so here's so this is this. I is will a, tell you one thing. Yeah, the Republicans are probably happy about this. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> I mean, I guess that I mean. He doesn't have to cast the budget vote. He's not going to be involved in the budget process. He's going to get away with not with casting. I think he did this because he didn't want to get involved in the budget fight. So, therefore, if he is a roadblock to a budget that Governor Tom Wolf is going to be signing, it will make him look bad in the uh, November election. So, therefore, he is skirting this and getting away from you know that responsibility. He's going to stand on side. Nope, I had no. I, I, he's going to stand on the sidelines. Said I had no hand in this at all, and then he's going to go after Tom Wolf on the budget. That's what I think he's going to do. Well, that's that's probably one of the. Um, that is probably one of the more astute readings I think of what could be going on here, right? Because there's no way this has. I mean, this there's it has to be something political or some sort of game that this guy is playing. Um, because it just it just doesn't even make sense unless that he's worried. He's in that, it to win it, so he's going to quit it. <laughs> right, right. Freaking, you know, I'm going to do what Sarah Palin did. <laughs> right? I'm going to quit. <laughs> right? And then I'm going to win by quitting. <laughs> it's weird. He's going to pull a Bob Dole. Yeah, Bob Dole here. Bob Dole. So here's or the, he knows he has no shot at fucking winning in November, and he's just giving up early. Well, I don't know. I, who knows, man? But, you know, you don't know what... I mean, I don't, thinking. I, I don't think that he thinks that... I think he was going through, like, a sugar rush at the time. Like, I, I think he's diabetic. <laughs> and I think it was, like, over the middle of the afternoon. And he was going through, like, a sugar lull. And just, boom! Like, out of nowhere. <laughs> I gotta quit! <laughs> I mean, he fucking quit, yeah. I gotta quit! <laughs> That's what I think... <laughs> I gotta quit. <laughs> He's a diabetic, and I think he like fucking shot himself up with too much insulin, and just boom, man. quitting, quitting, oh, man. just out of nowhere. That's a good idea, quitting. Good idea. <laughs> so this is from from Penn Live. So Penn Live said Senator Scott Wagner will resign his Senate seat. I'm like, you can even hear it in their lead, right? I can't wait for the puff piece about how he tried to come to Harrisburg and change things on Monday, coming from like you know the people at Penn Live. Oh, how such a great of a thing he was, and blah blah blah. And give him like this glaring puff piece, and that we can just vomit all over. Yeah, I mean, it's like so. I mean, yeah. So it's like so. Wagner, he like <laughs> he, he gave his letter. I, I mean, I, this is so weird. So like when asked about it, so the the Wagner spokesman um, Andrew Romeo said this right. Said, and Andrew Romeo, yeah, please worked detail. for Ed Gillespie down in Virginia, who ran an extremely racist campaign, by the way. Right, exactly. For governor. So Andrew, we just got, like... Andrew Romeo, in, everybody. Keep, keep that in mind. But keep that in mind. So this was Andrew... Andrew Romeo said this in a statement. This is Wagner's spokesman. Said, quote, Since winning his historic write-in campaign in 2014, it's been Scott's honor to serve the people of York and the state Senate. However... Since Tom Wolf has taken office, there has been nothing but gridlock in Harrisburg. And Scott realizes that the way he can bring about the most change and do the most good for the Commonwealth is to devote all of his time and energy toward getting elected governor and giving Pennsylvania. I mean, it's not like he showed up to votes choice. anyway. Huh? It's not like he skipped out on key votes anyway. Well, this is a Wolf, man. I mean, tell you, what the hell's gotten into this guy? I mean, Wolf's campaign is hitting back so hard. This is this is Wolf, right? This is his response. It's, quote, one week after skipping crucial votes to protect children in order to attend a political corporate policy summit and one month before the budget deadline proves that he is the very worst of Harrisburg. Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> <laughs> Holy. <laughs> Holy moly. I mean, seriously, man, this is like. I think it's coming from like his brain trust in the back of the room. Right, so like back a couple months ago at the. um at the uh, Pennsylvania Press Club luncheon, which is a, a monthly uh, luncheon um, where lobbyists and people from the media and unions and all the other special interest groups uh, get together at the Hilton. They have a luncheon. It's like $25 to get in. And you go there, you listen to someone speak, and Wagner was speaking. At one point, he said, my brain trust in the back of the room. 
and it's these fucking idiots from Red Maverick and these other groups. This is probably coming from his brain trust that he's surrounding himself with. Or he's like, hey, guys, I, I'm going to do this. Uh, and his lap dogs are, yeah, 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 anything you say, Master, because he is such an egomaniac. He's such a fucking control freak that he cannot, like, and no one can say no to him. No one can stand. I was like, I don't think this is a good idea. Like, I, like you know what I mean? Yeah. They, 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 don't want to be, they don't want to be hit. They don't want to be attacked by a madman on a sugar deficit. Uh, a sugar <laughs> <laughs> in the middle of the afternoon. I mean, he just he flies off the fucking handle at the flip of a switch. Well, you know, you I know, just... he's not like John Wayne or Rambo. He's just some crazy old guy with who has probably his fucking diabetes and goes through a sugar rush and does these things out of spontaneity. Sean, I wouldn't have to do this if it wasn't for George Soros. <laughs> yeah, the person he called a Hungarian Jew. Exactly. Exactly. But, you know, I'm what I'm interested in this, what's more interesting to me about, I mean, just the weirdness of Wagner stuff. But I'm looking over at the Wolf campaign, and I'm like, what the hell is happening here? Because, like, Beth Molina, right, she's the communication director for the Wolf campaign, is that, you know, she didn't pull any punch. They released a statement, and she basically comes out, hey, look, you know, during that time, right, when, you know, Wagner, right, you know, he, he was the confirmed nominee, right? He, he, do a t- he was, like, attend the Republican Governors Association 2018 New York Corporate Policy Summit from May 22nd to May 23rd. And she said, during that time, the Wagner, Wagner missed votes on keeping 17,000 sex offenders off Pennsylvania's registry, making domestic violence in the presence of children as a separate crime, requiring carbon monoxide detectors in child care facilities. And then, quote, Scott Wagner is only interested in furthering his own political ambitions, but his resignation does not erase his long record of supporting education cuts for our children, rolling back health care for hundreds of thousands of Pennsylvanians, and throwing seniors out of their nursing homes. Boom! <laughs> I mean, seriously. It's like, you know, I, I'm, I'm, look, if this is the flavor of a, of a rebranding in the Wolf administration, like well, looking forward, going forward, man, I'm in. Right? I'm in. I don't, I don't know why I would call it a rebranding. Okay. I mean, talk me through it. So his the people he surrounded himself with are pretty savage to begin with when it comes to like communications and social media. Okay. Like uh, JJ Abbott, who I piss off at times. <laughs> I mean, he's pretty savage on social media. He's the governor's spokesperson. He's someone you don't want to go toe to toe with on social media about things, especially on Twitter. Um, you know, just from being out here and he's extremely, I mean, I'm not surprised that the wolf is doing this, that he just went out of the gate punching. Well, I mean, I mean I'm, I'm some impressed. Some people are surprised like from the outside who like, wow, wolf is like rebranding. I'm not really surprised that he's doing this. Well, I'm glad to hear I that. I mean, he, these are the type of people he's surrounded himself with for a while, but I mean, now they're just in full campaign mode. Well, you know, I'm I'm glad to hear it because look, look, I I saw. Here's the thing: is here's the thing, right? It, in my <laughs> mind, some of the differences, like look, look, if you look at the like Wolf's campaign for governor, right, this first time round, right, the first time it was round that is, like I'm driving a jeep, I have the family business, right, saved this, all these jobs, and he blah, was blah, the blah. absolutely he was the kind and of Tom Corbett was the worst like fucking person like the best person to run against right I mean, he's he's lucked out against running against two of like the easiest campaign opponents but they're completely different right where, exactly. like but Corbett that shows you the, that asshole. shows right but that shows you exactly what you're talking about is that you've got savvy people around them too because that that first campaign was like man this is i'm this, i'm the, ex- the I, I am i am the opposite to wolf i'm the referendum i'm the referendum to corbett where now it's like you want him and just, I mean, the worst of Harrisburg is the best, like, I mean, because, like, he, that's who he hangs out with, the worst people in Harrisburg. Matt Brie, I mean, like, you know, like, their right. office is one four below the people who are trying to break all of the unions in Pennsylvania. I mean, you, you, I mean, you have to tell me that there's no coordination going on between uh, the Fairness Center, which is a C4, a nonprofit. And the and the Wagner campaign, which is illegal, you're going to tell me that's not going to happen when they're one floor apart from the in the same office building. 
Sean. Like he is Sean, hanging out look. with the worst of Harrisburg. No, look, 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 look. That dumbwaiter that they had installed in that building had <laughs> nothing to do with coordination. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> nothing. <laughs> okay? Get it straight. <laughs> it was just a carrier pigeon going from floor to floor. Just those carrier pigeons were a legitimate expense in case of power outages. <laughs> yeah, so. Right? But, like, I mean, look, do you remember that speech? Look, I, I go back, and here's what's, you know, again, the big question is, is can the Pennsylvania Democratic Party, and I, I can't say that without laughing, can, can the Pennsylvania Democratic Party rise to the challenge and rise to the campaign that Wolf is showing them the way towards? And I look. I have. I have even more hope I now so, that. Fe- wait, 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 wait. I have even more f- hope now that Fetterman is now his running mate, and that Wolf has pretty much gone straight forward and kind of embraced Fetterman. Fetterman's in a that. bodyguard. Well, it's freaking awesome, right? <laughs> and so it's. I like, mean, it's Fetterman awesome. is there in case Wagner uh, goes on a sugar rush in a debate <laughs> and tries lunges at Wolf, and Fetterman is. There. You know what I would love to see? I would love to see John Fetterman show up at a Scott Wagner campaign event with a camera and hide behind a little tree (laughs) and see if Wagner decides to try to take him out (laughs) like he did that guy. (laughs) That would be a fun show. That would be a fun show. But but what 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 I mean is like, okay, so let's roll back. Do you remember the kind of those after the kind of the the first major budget fight that Wolf had with with Republicans? And he was, I think legitimately disgusted at what was going on. And he came up that following year with the kind of like, you know, whatever his, his budget address and everything. And he like freaking like dressed down Republicans, like from the state. I mean, from the dais, I mean, he, it was unbelievable. It was scathing. It was, I was in the balcony. Yeah. Of, I was watching that from the balcony. Yeah. And the look on people's faces were like, Holy shit. It was unbelievable. I was like, I was like, I, I was oscillating between like absolute elation and discomfort because I'm like, oh my god, this is like so uncomfortable. He has it in him. Oh my god, it was amazing. But then what happened? He delivers this thing, and the next day, and the day after that, and the day after that, like the Democrats and the Democratic Party were just like a bunch of crickets, right? That was an opportunity to like you know go whole hog. Right at the Republicans who have been very, they defunded education, who've been who've been playing games with our budgeting, and no, they and just I got quiet. Brett uh, Banatelli has been talking about this on Twitter. We do not need people who will compromise with Republicans. We need people who will bury them. Exactly. Yes, and like I mean, yes, we are in full on bury mode. Yes, we we have to fucking bury these people. Look, you we have, have to, to bury them as a political party. The they go- are done with. That, look, there is that, no more compromising no. with the Republican Party. It is over. Yes. It is done. Yes. It is time to put Machiavellian politics up front and center and bury them in public. You know, like all they want to do is gore people in public, gore the other side. It is time that we play that same way. No, we, we do not. We know we're not compromising. No, we are going to bury you in public and we are going to do it in the town square. Right. And that's the way it's got to be. I mean, look. The, the, it, and no, it's it, it's the way it has to be because that's the way that they made that's it. That's exactly what I was going to say. It has to be this way because they set the table this way. And so when you show up to that table, right, you've got to basically say, you know what? No. And you know what Wolf did? Not going to be the meal. <laughs> Mango's body wasn't even cold yet. The bo- Mango's body was still warm by the time he put out that first ad. Yeah. Going after going after. I mean that that I think that ad is brilliant. The worst of Harrisburg ad with like Rambo. And- it was incredible. I mean, you, you, we we went. That was was that the day that we went? We went on the podcast. We went on a Wednesday, right? It was yeah, the day yeah, after that the, Wednesday morning. It was the day after the primary, and like and it was like and you said, look look at this. This like is like day I mean, one, boom. And like we it. went this early, is, this right? How we are going to do this from here on out? Exactly. And we went in the morning, right? We were early that day, like and like it was already out. Yeah, this is like nine o'clock. In the, yeah, like <laughs> no, and that is how we have to uh, fight Wagner in order to beat him. We must bury him in public. Yes, and it's going to be fun doing that. There you go, man. So I, I'm, I'm encouraged. Look, I am so encouraged. I have to say, I am so encouraged about what's happening in Pennsylvania right now. Um, that it, it just it, 
it's making going forward to 2018, uh, like, I'm excited about it. I'm excited about it. I'm excited about the politics. I'm excited about the energy. I'm excited about, like, people on the ground, right? Um, and so, you know, and it's been it's been a long slog to get to that point to feel this kind of excitement. But, um, but man, um, all the more reason to kind of, you know, be following these campaigns and see what's happening on a daily basis. Cause, like, we have an opportunity in this state um, to not just affect what's happening in our state and fundamentally change what's happening in the state, but to alter the directions of national politics. Yeah. Freaking A, man. Um, so speaking of altering the direction of national <laughs> politics, <laughs> you were at a raise the wage demo today. Yes, I was. <laughs> and how'd that go? <laughs> it was emceed by the John Myerson. The John Myerson. John, yeah. shout out John, man. Uh, I, I don't know if he knows what a, what a podcast is. I think he's still using an AOL account. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry. This will go back to him. <laughs> yeah, we'll get back to him. Um, we make uh, we, I bust his balls all the time about him being old in the union. But uh, no, a uh, bunch of unions held a press conference today. It wasn't really a rally. It was more like a press conference on uh, raising your wage in Pennsylvania from uh, $12 to $12 an hour right now to – Fifteen dollars in twenty twenty three, and for those of you who don't know, that is uh, five years from now, I think. So twenty twenty three, yeah. For those of you who can do, and math, by the time right. uh, by the time we get to twenty twenty three, that fifteen dollars an hour will be as worthless as the ten ten uh, resolution that they were pushing uh, a few years ago. But we're making progress. Look, all right, so I'm going to say my piece here, okay? So, gonna... so I, I have an issue with this, and we, we had a really good conversation today with John. Um, he likes being pushed to the left. He's not going to argue with anyone being pushed to the left. Um, we must uh, start considering two things, UBI, universal basic income for everyone, and that a minimum wage ding, ding, must ding, be ding, at least $20 an hour. Ding, 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 ding. Right? I, absolutely. I mean, especially if you're going to talk mean, there, about there, the graduated there, stuff. We there, there are other countries in this uh, – world right now that have a minimum wage close to twenty dollars an hour and that's where we should be that's where the conversation should be i agree we must be talking about a minimum living wage a minimum living wage that's what possibility sounds like folks yeah that's absolutely so listen here's the here's the thing to all my union members out there right <laughs> to all my fellow union members so this is like this in my mind, this is what our political situation looks like. And we're not trashing John. No, 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 no. Listen, no. Like, I'm gonna. You're, you're gonna hear. Listen to me, right? Sean's getting all nervous. <laughs> <laughs> listen, here's the deal, right? I, I like anybody who's read any freaking history books about massive social movements and things that are brought about change know this basic fact, and we have to re-educate ourselves on this basic fact. All right. Take your union. You have representatives, elected officials in the union that are democratically elected to lead the union and are and people who are appointed to various positions to accomplish certain ends. All right? The people who are out there and having to work with politicians, they're having to kind of like negotiate behind the scenes, to kind of lobby, to kind of get certain legislation forward and all of that, they have to be the reasonable people. OK, they have to be the people that are going to get, you know, they're not going to get a door slammed in their face. Right. They're going to say, OK, come on, sit down. Hey, you know, John, you know, John Myerson, perfect example. John, come on in. Let's let's talk about what's going on. Right. That's a role within a political movement. Right. The power in the political movement does not come from that moderating role. The power comes from the militancy of the members, right? We had this metaphor in, in our local and at ABSCUF, right? We talked about leadership models in ABSCUF. There's always been people who say, listen, we got to get along with the administration and we got to be nice to them. And, you know, they're trying to as well. These people that kind of want to kind of make everything look. And if they're in the leadership position that they have to kind of deal with them, that's fine for them. That is not the role of members. Your role as a member is to make demands upon your leadership so that 
the image you want in your head is anyone that you elect to a leadership position, anyone who's heading your union, you want them to be standing, talking to legislators, talking to politicians, talking to the boss, with basically their arms spread out wide. With the metaphors, like, see these arms right here? I'm basically holding back my members. I'm here talking to you. And let's solve this thing. But my arms are getting tired, and my members are getting pissed. So what's it going to be? We can talk, or I can let my arms go and let the members at you. Right? That is a position of power. But that can't be a bluff. That has to be real. Right? So enough of this kind of purity in politics or all, you know, like one size fits all kind of garbage. Members, we need, and look, this is happening across the state. We see this in victories in local elections. We've DSA. seen this in, what's that? DSA members. Do DSA members. We see this kind of activism that has taken place. Fetterman. We see that with Fetterman. We see that kind of thing. And like, and I believe that that's the direction that we got to go. I mean, there are people in the Democratic Party who do not want to get rid of the tip minimum wage. While one of the only members pushing for that is Patty Kim. She is the originator of that idea. Her and Dalen Leach are the originators of getting rid of the tipped minimum wage. What, so you could only work for tips? Is that what you're talking about? No. Where um, people working in restaurants aren't getting paid two sixty three an hour, and they are getting paid the actual minimum wage. Imagine that, people. Imagine if you were working, if you were a wait staff at a restaurant, Right. And you're even if you're getting God forbid, you were getting like the minimum wage in Pennsylvania right now was seven twenty five. Yeah. Right. The absolute like the bottom the of the barrel. Governments. Well, technically it's not right. Technically, it's below the, the federal like the federal yeah. minimum wage. But whatever, they have to abide by the federal regulations because big government. Right. <laughs> but imagine that if you were fi- you were making seven twenty five an hour and getting tips. Think about what would happen oh, to still your... still not a lot of money. Yeah. Think about what would happen to your ability to pay your rent and, like, go on vacation. <laughs> Seriously. And that's at seven twenty five. Imagine if you actually were getting $15 an hour and tips. How about that? All right? That's what those folks are talking about. This bullshit... That you should get paid like what a dollar for a wage. You know, there are Democrats in the legislature who do not want to get rid of the minimum wage. Yeah, and guess what? Because, Those people should be run out of, of the town. Power that the Pennsylvania uh, Restaurant and Lodging Association have in the state. Yeah, we look. This is where we got to get super, super savvy, folks, and run those people out of town. There, there should be no way. Not only should not only should the war be on like the Republican Party, time to bury the Republican Party because of what they've done, but we also basically have to run those people off, right? Scare the crap out of them to say that no, 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 no. Sorry, you're not going to support this base thing. You have a choice. You either support our agenda, right, or bye bye. We're going to primary you the hell out of there, Costa. We're going to primary you out of here, right? That's what's got to be. That's what it's got to be. Yeah. The whole idea, you're holding back the membership. I gave, you know, I, I was at this conference several years ago, and that was the title of my paper, Holding Back the Membership. That was the model. That is the metaphor that we've got to have. And that is on us members. That is not just like, we can't sit down there and whine and complain about our, our union doing X, Y, and Z. You are the union. I am the union. We are the union. The people that we elect to represent us have to be pushed, and we need to push them every step of the way. And guess what? Those good union leaders who are out there will welcome the push. Because a lot of the people that got into union leadership positions, right? they got into the union leadership positions because they believe in the values of labor. They believe in the values of the union. They believe in the power of negotiation. They believe in the power of workers. Right? But as they've seen the kind of like workers disengage in part, and this is in part because of the union structure and the business unionism and all that other kind of stuff, like they felt they've had to make trade-offs, right? But if you step up and you organize, right, and you stand behind and you push your leadership, right, man, what what is possible is amazing. So 
It's my peps, my pep talk for tonight, Sean. Yep. <laughs> He's like, yep. <laughs> Sean, it's the miscommunication. And I mean miscommunication by free will brewing. Yeah, that's speaking <laughs> right All right, well, so I, I, look, I don't want to keep you too late tonight because I know you got to get up bright and early <laughs> to go see your friend Lou. <laughs> got your alarm set? Yeah, Lou Barlett is going to be at a press conference in the Capitol Rotunda. Was he gonna, what was he going to be talking about, puppies? Uh, no, actually, he's going to be talking about uh, school safety and gun issues. Oh, so he's, he's actually finally getting behind gun control. <laughs> uh, no, he's having Mike Regan there. Ah. Uh, so that's good. Yeah. So are they gonna, I'm looking are, forward to it. You know, I love when people who are running for Senate decide to have uh, – events in public spaces where they can't like block people from entering yeah like nice right so i mean no one really recognizes me there from the uh the the lou campaign so i might be able to pop off a couple questions like how come he votes (laughs) against uh, universal background checks even when stopping people who have uh, mental health issues from getting guns lou what is your problem with brown people (laughs) we can start off with that Right? <laughs> I'll just yell that question out there. Yeah. How come you don't like immigrants? <laughs> right, exactly. Just like out of nowhere, completely off topic, and right. just fucking derail the whole. No, uh, I want to um, do that one day. Like, I want to go there to a press conference and derail the thing. Let's like, let... And just like ask like, a completely off topic question that just like derails the whole entire thing. Look, look, let, let, let's workshop some questions right here. Like, let's, like, like here we are. Like, right? like let, let's have a, uh, let's have a thought experiment. How about this thought experiment? About, um, um, uh, Barletta, what, what's his, what's his official position now? Representative? Congressman, yeah. Congressman. Congressman. Um, Congressman Barletta, um, has anybody seriously considered the prospect of throwing illegal immigrants at protesters, like, uh, um, live action shooters Right, as a way of preventing uh, further deaths. Well, like that. <laughs> Can you merge your anti-immigrant policy making with your pro-gun, anti-school shooter ideas? What would that look like? <laughs> right, <laughs> Congressman Barletta. <clears throat> Shall we use immigrants as human shields to stop school shooters? I heard that the ammunition that's used in most school shootings was made in Mexico. Is that true? (laughs) (laughs) That would be a good one. You got to admit that. That would be a good one. (laughs) He would kind of like look. You you would like actually see like him like trying to process the question. (laughs) That'd be freaking awesome. Yeah. Like it's always been like a dream of mine to like derail a press conference, like just completely just like ask a question and just drive it off the fucking rails. Congressman Barletta, can we just build a wall around schools? <laughs> Mexico <laughs> should pay for those walls. That, that might be because a good they one. make the ammunition. <laughs> that might be a good one. Can we just build a wall around the schools? Instead of, excuse me, uh, Congressman Barletta. Instead of building a wall around the border, can we just build a wall around schools to keep them safe? Keep the school safe, Congressman Barletta. And he would like, I, I think like at that point, it would probably be like. It'd be awesome. It'd be <laughs> awesome. It'd be an event then. It'd, it'd be an actual occurrence. It'd be an event. It'd be a happening. <laughs> I'm pretty sure like. <laughs> You'd be dragged out of the room. <laughs> oh, no. Well, it's like, this is actually in the Capitol Rotunda. Yeah. So well, they really can't do anything. Well, yeah, well. Congressman Barletta, who does your hair? <laughs> Do you dye your teeth? <laughs> Are your teeth Congressman actually- Barletta, you said you're really close to Trump. How close? <laughs> Are you pitching or catching? <laughs> oh, oh, boy. Sean just went off the rails there. <laughs> Anyways. So that's uh, that'll be fun to see what Sean comes up with today. Um, also, like check out Sean's pictures of the um, of the um, uh, raise the wage demo today. We also um, uh, we found out that uh, Mark Price um, gave a speech on uh, how it's like to live on minimum wage. 
I heard about this on, while like, having on, a van, on Twitter. While having a van down by the river. Does Mark Price live down by the river? Yes, he actually has a, he aspires. He is inspiring all of us to uh, get a van and live down by the river. There it is. Mark Price, Pennsylvania Budget and Policy Center. <laughs> His official recommendation, <laughs> live in a van down by the river. <laughs> I didn't say it. <laughs> uh, Sean, you'll hear about that one. So, all right. <clears throat> So uh, we have, uh, believe it or not, we have not hit the like the 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 the, the joyous part of our uh, podcast yet. Um, in today's last call, we're going to talk about Star Wars. We're going to talk about moon bases, and we're going to talk about beer. Um, and we're going to talk about the problems with beer, right? All that kind of coming up. All right, this is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. I uh, want to remind you. Um, support the work that we're doing here. On, is, you know, you don't like the special Thirsty Thursday version? Or maybe you love the special Thirsty Thursday version. The most important thing is, right, is that we need to support progressive pull-no-punches homegrown media. Right? If we have any hope for the long haul of bringing a bar, bring a Bart, a Bart, a Bart Simpson, no, bringing, like, the kind of progressive future to bear, um, we need to support our media. We need to support our organizations. Become a member of Raging Chicken Press for as little as five bucks a month. Just go to patreon.com slash RC Press. Become a member today. We'll be back right after this with our last call. This is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. Over the past six years, we've brought unapologetic, progressive, activist media to Pennsylvania and beyond. We've helped hold those in power accountable and shine a light on some amazing activist work. We've broken national stories and established a reputation as an aggressive, independent media site. As newsrooms close and traditional journalists lose their jobs, hard-hitting, investigative news suffers. If we care about our democracy, we have to find new, sustainable models of journalism. And frankly, no one's going to do it for us. After the Trump election, we dug in even deeper. Thanks to some longtime members, one-time donations, and a shift in other resources, we brought on more writers and started paying them. Now we're doubling down and want to expand our infrastructure and pay our writers even more. We need to invest in our media if we have a chance to resist the unprecedented assault on democracy, working families, women's rights, and our planet. History will remember the choices we make today. So take a minute to become a member of Raging Chicken Press. For as little as $5 a month, the price of a local craft beer or a cup of coffee, you will be supporting homegrown progressive journalists and media activists. Go to RagingChickenPress.org and click on the Support and Membership tab to become a member. Leave a one-time donation or learn about other ways that you can help. We don't have billionaire backers. Keeping progressive, activist media going strong depends on you. Thank you for all your help and support. Keep up the fight. Space is a war-fighting domain, just like the land, the air, and sea. We have the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Space Force. Ah, my new national strategy could be... You gotta love it, Sean. Come on. Space Force, <laughs> space, 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 space. <laughs> there you go. That is, once again, the Gregory Brothers uh, with... Uh, Space Force, uh, and also special kudos and thank you to Donald Trump for saying that <laughs> to begin with. Um, so let's get the most important stuff out of the way. First, Sean watched Star Wars. Sean, you watch Star Wars. I didn't think this yes. was ever going to happen. I feel like I, like I feel like there's been a new threshold crossed. Right? It's 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 an amazing moment, right, in the history of this podcast. In the history, it's just the time I've known you really um, that you watch Star Wars. <laughs> So, I've watched Star Wars a bunch of times. I'm not a what? Star Wars geek or fan. Or geek. Wait, 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 wait. You've been holding out? Is that what you're telling everybody here? <laughs> You've been holding out? You're a closet Star Wars fan is what you're telling me? I'm not going to go that far. Oh, see? Look at this. He's backpedaling already. 
He's back. I watched a, um, a New Hope was on uh, cable TV on uh-huh. Memorial Day. Yeah. And I decided to watch it straight through. Straight through. Straight through. With yes. commercials and everything. What's that? With commercials and everything. Yeah. Holy moly. I was kind of bored. Ah, uh, she's yeah, you're not allowed to say that in the last call. So, <laughs> <laughs> so okay. What was your favorite part of Star Wars: A New Hope? I mean, like, <laughs> I watched it. <laughs> oh my god! No, I mean, um, like, Sean's like the favorite part of Star Wars: A New Hope. So I, it was I did the not beer. realize that in New Hope is when they did, they destroyed the Death Star. Uh huh. So I thought that was like the third one, Return of the Jedi. Um, like when you know, freaking amateur the Falcon out of the Death Star. You're a freaking amateur. And, what's that? Yeah, I had my hope up here, but you're a freaking <laughs> amateur. <laughs> you're barely an amateur. Like I know the, I know, I, I know you know the, the general arc of the story, story that you read on Twitter. Is that what you're telling me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't have like new Han Solo books. Okay, <laughs> I do. I do. I you know I do. I saw them. <laughs> yes, I did. Yeah. So here, okay. Here's the story with that. So, so Sean, when he came back in town last week, um, I had bought him. I think we've mentioned this on the show before, but I had bought um, several of the sours. Um, because Free Will had a special release, and uh, great. So I bought him some of the stuff, and he stopped by. And I had just bought um, uh, the trilogy. There's a Han Solo, uh, Han Solo trill. Okay, look, the Han Solo movie came out last Friday. Right, which I can't believe I didn't put it on the show for today. But the Han Solo movie came out last Friday. And so you see this kind of big marketing up push. There's a, there's a trilogy about basically the origin story of Han Solo, right? Uh, and my kid is like, my son, uh, Rowan, is just like, um, he's he's a reading, like, madman, right? I mean, he just kind of reads nonstop. And he's hitting the end, like, he's at book nine of this, you know, nine book series um, that he's reading right now. Wings of Fire is this dragon story thing. Um and so I said, well, what else could he like? I was like, oh, he might actually be into this, right? So I actually got the got the three novels. And I'm like, oh, I'll read them too. This would be kind of fun. And so when, But when Sean came, uh, when he stopped by to pick up his beer and kind of chat and catch up and all that kind of stuff, I was like, hey, Sean, look, I got the special thing for you. The Han Solo thing might be for And there was like a brief moment where like, you know, like at least from my perspective, I'm like, He's like, like, is he serious? Or is he, is he it's done driving the car for two hours. <laughs> That's awesome, but no, that was good. But well, more serious stuff. But uh, you also, man, it's like you know, you had these pictures that you were floating out, and you were telling me about this. How you pick up some um, awesome art out in Harrisburg. Yes, and I did. Got it all hung so, up. I um, every Memorial Day weekend uh, in Harrisburg, there is the Arts Fest, which is the first time I was able to go that in a couple of years because I was not working this past weekend for some reason. Um, I don't know why I wasn't working, but I just wasn't, and. Um, <laughs> and so I, I had off. I, all so what ended up happening was I walked. I, I had my bike. Walked to uh, walking by. You know, it's just like a lot of nice pictures and, and like you know artists in the area, people who um, put uh, like their art their prints for sale. And there was this one stand that caught my attention, and uh, they had they do so it was like screen silk screen print on like a wooden board. Mm-hmm. Like a thin, like wooden board of uh, different things, specific to uh, Baltimore, Phil- Baltimore, Pittsburgh, and Philadelphia, and mainly Harrisburg. Right, the, the artist is from Baltimore, which is like ninety minutes away from here. Um, I've been to Baltimore a couple of times since I moved out here. Um, you know, it's really not that far. It's a great thing about living in Harrisburg. You're ninety minutes away from Philly. Yeah, ninety minutes away from Baltimore. Ninety minutes away from DC, and like three hours away from New York, and right. three from Pittsburgh. So you're kind of like pretty centrally locate, located out here. Um, chatting up the, with the guy, uh, and one of the things was framed. So we didn't we didn't talk. We talked. I left. Start day drinking. Um, it was <laughs> like ninety. It was like ninety degrees out and like a complete swamp. Well, in this so case, just, in this case, everybody, you should you should read day drinking as greasing the wallet. <laughs> is what it is. <laughs> yeah. So um, went to. Uh, I went to McGrath's, and they had they had the all day IPA on, and they had the Founders Solid Gold Lager. So I wasn't not drinking like heavy IPAs. I was drinking like four percent beers pretty much at that point. Had a couple of them. Had some chicken fingers and fries, and 
before I left, I actually struck up a really good conversation uh, with people who I used to bartend customers I used to see at Pizza Boy. Mm-hmm. And I would never like I, I I knew like the one guy was like a like blue collar worker and just the type of thing you don't talk about politics there like their political affiliations. Guy was an IBEW member out here in West Central Pennsylvania uh, from Perry County, which people make fun of out here. Perry County is like kind of like we're uh, you know all those uh, hillbilly stereotypes are are formulated from, and we had a really good start up a really good conversation. Uh, Turns out there are really progressive people <laughs> and forward thinking people who live out in Perry County and who live out in parts of the state that have not that pretty much have been forgotten by the Democratic Party. Well, this is and this is Fetterman's claim from the begin from the get go, yes, right? Yeah, this is exactly where we got to. They voted for Bernie Sanders. They voted for John Fetterman simply because the Democrats have for because they have felt forgotten. By the Democratic Party. Well, you, well, you know why, Sean? I think I think we need to remind everybody this. People think you might flip the House and Senate this November, but you guys always find a way to mess it up. You're somehow going to lose by 12 points to a guy named Jeff Pedophile Nazi Doctor. <laughs> oh, he's a doctor. <laughs> oh, he's a doctor. Yeah. Oh, he's a doctor. I mean, exactly. these are people who are talking about moving to Burlington, Vermont, simply because they could be close to Bernie Sanders. Yeah, that's a little uh, creepy too. But whatever. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, this is like the type of mindset that they have. And yeah, no, like, no, no, I know. I get like, you. We don't call ourselves Democrats. We're progressives and independents and stuff like that. And you know, like there are people out in the middle of central Pennsylvania. We had this conversation today. Uh, ran into uh, Just King's uh, campaign manager. Just King had like 70 write-in votes on the Republican ticket in her primary, which is kind of odd for people. I mean, like that message of unity, that message of, you know, hey, these issues of health care and student debt are affecting all of us. You know, like one of the things they said, America is the only country in the world where you can get sick and lose everything. Yep. And these are people from Perry County. Perry go, County, man. which like is the one of the poorest fucking counties in the whole entire state. Right now, imagine imagine if you were a competent party, for example, and you were working out in Perry co- uh, County, and you went you're talking to these people, right? Um, these folks that actually have got stories to tell that are from Perry County, and you actually brought them into the party, you brought them into the campaign, and their stories are the ones that were told. Right? This is not hard, people. This is not hard. No. Right. So. I just want to point out at this point that the story started with you buying art prints. <laughs> so yeah, and we I'm talked just saying, about I, just, I just want to make sure because there's they're, people out there right they're, now. They're, they're like, like they're, wait, they're, you they're... were talking about these art prints. And then now we're talking about Perry County and the Democratic Party again. How did we get there? So it's a little bit <laughs> so, of a cul-de-sac, so, but so let's the, bring us back like out to Main Street. To be had during this conversation. <laughs> and I left, <laughs> doubled back to the Arts Fest walking my bike through the arts fest because i was not riding it at this point with a greasy wallet <laughs> <laughs> and i went to that guy who had the prints um you know during the, earlier in the day uh i asked him what one of the prints cost they're 125 dollars without the frame left came back obviously had the conversation about perry county and everything and uh he noticed that he knew i was like interested in one of the prints so but i settled for like a small one of the bridge the mm-hmm. walking bridge which um about 25 20 25 years ago uh, the bridge center of the one part of the bridge collapsed on the West shore side, right? The one, the one walking bridge that I love taking pictures of, and we'll talk about this in a couple of minutes, um, was, uh, crushed due to an ice jam. So there's like a big, like 80, 90, hundred foot gap between like the bridges, like just a couple of like sections of the bridges missing. And it's just like a relic of this time sitting there. So I got that. And he said, name your price on the print that I was looking at, interested in, which is the uh, Capitol Dome uh, with the Capitol underneath of it. And what they do is they uh, took the pictures, put them in Photoshop, came up with the artwork, put it, then they made a silkscreen print of it. And I said, you know what, just me, I was like, I'll give you 125 for the photo with the frame. Yeah. Which was 50, which was $25 cheaper than the price. And he gave me that and the small square as a um as a consolation gift i guess that's pretty you know, pretty i didn't awesome, want to man. like lowball him in the artwork 
knowing that you really don't make that much money by putting a frame onto your photos. It's more just a decoration piece that adds value to the art. Right. You so know, I was like, hey, just give, I'll give you, like, I'll pay you for, I was like, I just give you, I'll, I was like, listen, I don't want to low, low ball you. I'll give you 125 for that piece that I got of the Capitol, which is like uh, 16 inches wide by like 30 inches uh, tall. And put that up on my wall. And he's like, yeah. He's like, here, have both pieces then. <clears throat> That's pretty awesome, man. It's like, you know, and it's funny. It's like just what you described there. It's so, you know, when you start, when you stop thinking about like that engagement, right? Like I'm buying something solely from the position of like a consumer, right? The idea that we've been trained just to kind of like, we want it, to get the as best cheap as deal possible. possible. Yeah. And then you start seeing it as a, as a, as a producer, right? As somebody who's also like yourself, right? I mean, who are taking these pictures, you think, you know, what goes into this stuff, you know, that actually when you're producing these things, that there's value in this and there's work that's involved. You know, again, you know, I, you know, I was always struck when you first told me that story as I was thinking about, this is like really the baseline of like, of, of work in general, right? Is like, once you start thinking about what that engagement is all about, right? What kind of like, you know, that back and forth, that relationship between that person that you're buying this from and the person that, and, and then you're kind of paying something for, and you're recognizing that there's real value in that work. It's important. You know, this is kind of what Marx talked about years, you know, you know, whatever centuries ago as, as, as you know, alienation is that when we become kind of divorced from, you know, the people who actually produce stuff, we lose that whole perspective, right? So that was just kind of this cool moment, I thought, just when you're telling that story to me yeah. the first time. and he's making that. a profit off of both of those prints that he made. Yeah. I mean, the time and energy, I mean, he's from Baltimore. He had to get the pictures up here in Harrisburg of these landmarks, put them in Photoshop, and then come up with a uh, silkscreen print for them. But, I mean, for $125, he's still making a really good margin on both of them. But I didn't want to lowball him. Like, oh yeah, I'll take that for like seventy five bucks. I because I, I felt like that would have been disrespectful. Well, yeah, exactly. And it's also like kind of like uh, like he's making a good margin. Is like, and he should, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, he put the time and the effort into doing that. I mean, the painting that uh, he got is from the painting I got that the silk screen print is from two thousand and fourteen. So he has a bunch of these prints that are sitting around from a few years ago. And I'm like, yeah, just give me that for one hundred twenty five bucks price without the frame and that's pretty much what i said and he's just like all right yeah here's the uh that's awesome and he's, and he's like here's both that's i was cool like stuff. oh thanks i i pre i wasn't expecting that from him yeah yeah so, so kudos 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 you want to give him a shout out or are you gonna you're gonna keep it quiet uh, his name is i don't have it in front of it it's burton art out of um out of baltimore out of baltimore well, i think it's andy burton i uh, yeah my phone's in the other room. I think I got that. Or what, I could pull up yeah. my Instagram right now, actually. Yeah. We'll try to put a link out there. Um, yeah. Kind of that um, his videos. one second. I am pulling it up. So it is his Instagram page is Charlie Burton and it's called Art by Barton. Art by B-A-R-T-O-N. And he's out of Baltimore. He does these really good silk screen prints. Um, they're like different types of like different levels of like blues and stuff like that. So. Yeah, it's really nice. And nice, the man. funny thing is, I put a picture of that up on Facebook or up on my Twitter account. And one of my customers from Pizza Boy that I know works in the state government bought one of the same things. And he said twinning. So that was pretty cool. <laughs> so I was not the only one who bought the picture or the print of the Capitol Dome and the Capitol building underneath of it. There you go, man. There you go. Cool. Yes. Well, cool. So, um, so uh, in the uh, kind of I'm looking to what? Go ahead. Sorry. I guess sell prints. What? I'm going to be selling prints. Yeah. Well, that's what I was going to say. Is like, well, I'm looking at the uh, you know on the buying end of things, but uh, you're looking to actually start uh, raking in some of the photography <laughs> gold too, if I might say so. Yes. <laughs> so what's going on, man? Um. So yeah, I was talking to people the past couple weeks. Um. I have finally uh, committed to making that jump and ordering my own prints and uh, selling them. There you go, man. 
So what I'm going to be doing is uh, I ordered a bunch of I ordered about like eight prints. One, I want to keep one for myself to put up in my apartment for me. Um, prints of the Walnut Street walking bridge from the snowstorm that I that happened over the winter time. And you, uh, you know I walked about a mile in the snow uh, to get this picture. <laughs> And it was like the one picture I wanted to fucking get in the snowstorm. And it is that walking bridge. It's a 10 by 10. These are going to be 10 by 10 prints. It's a nice square print of the walking bridge covered in snow uh, before they plowed it and shoveled it off. And it is going to be awesome. I have, it's black and white. I put it on metallic um, paper. And I'm going to put that stuff once it comes in the mail. I actually ordered it last night. Uh, that's going to be coming in the mail this week. And... I'm going to be putting them onto a foam board. I'm going to be putting them on, mounting them on a foam core, which gives a nice, like, thicker uh, feel to it. It's not going to be a mat. And then I'm going to try to, I'm going to, I'm going to be selling them. And I think I'm going to be selling prints from here on out. Uh, maybe do like one or two prints a month, like between five and 10 prints of each. And then, uh, yeah, have a little hobby of it. Well, I'll tell you, it's like, um, and what I'm looking to do, this is what I'm going to say, when Sean has some of these prints, um, I think that uh, we're going to have to do a special little giveaway here at uh, Raging Chicken. Um, maybe a membership given it giveaway or something like this where we kind of, as Raging Chicken, will buy a couple of Sean's prints, um, uh, kind of support his work, um, but then actually give it away to new members that are coming out or someone who wants to make a, a kind of donation um, towards our work here. Um, you know, in support of that. So that's kind of, kind of what at least I'm thinking about, um, as Sean is kind of making this, uh, this move forward. Cause really his photography has been, has been, man, has improved by, you know, leaps and bounds. He gets these different cameras. He tells me all about freaking F stops and all this other shit. And like, I, I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, you know, like I, you know, and again, I, I, I say that, I say that like, um, with your new camera, with my new camera, like it's well, very it valuable, a better focusing system than my camera. Yeah. So I'm a little jealous about that. Well, when I say that, and I'll say this to, you know, I, I, when I'm saying the, um, um, you know, Sean's telling me all these F stops and all this shit, I don't mean that in, like, in a bad way. I mean, like, like it's incredibly valuable. And I kind of realize that, you know, like how much I have to learn just about how to use this camera that I've got, you know. Um, and, um, you know, Sean's just, he's an incredible just resource it's- to just to kind of like, like, walk me through some of the base stuff because he's taught himself this stuff and he's producing like awesome work. So, yeah. And, um, like, I mean, there are photos that I take and put up on my Instagram page that I will not print. I just don't think they're like worthy of the print. Right, 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 right. But I mean, there are things that I want to do now. Um, like for instance, I put a picture up of the arch bridge. Like it's on my Facebook page. It's my cover photo. The arch. And it's like, it's like we, there's, there's these old arch, um, stone concrete arch bridges um railroad bridges here in harrisburg that give like that roman like aqueduct type of look to it so one of the things i want to do stand in the bike path right with this like big arch bridge use that arch as a natural frame to frame up all the other bridges in harrisburg going all the way down the riverfront interesting like a half mile three quarters of a mile down get all that in in focus and yeah so there, there there's some things i want to work on this summer and getting that done you just heard it here an exclusive look inside the <laughs> mind the creative mind of sean kitchen <laughs> but no like this is the type of thing where i got press passes uh to see bernie sanders and bill clinton speak during the primaries and afterwards i was telling myself i cannot go another election cycle um without having a camera Yep, and and I'm going to be shooting some campaigns. There you go, man. There I got some go. campaigns who are interested in doing this. So, well, I mean, I tell you, you've been, you know, I, like I said, my, all kudos to you because uh, you've been doing freaking amazing work. I mean, the pictures. I mean, if, ha- if people haven't seen his pictures um, from um, the Bernie Sanders and uh, Just King rally out there in Lancaster, um, like seriously fantastic stuff fantastic stuff so we look Thank forward you. to seeing some of those prints sean man i can't wait 
Yeah, I can't wait either. I can't. I have this image, okay, and like again, this is just me being like total like whatever rando when it comes to like photo stuff. But I could almost see, you know, that picture you've got of the of the bridge that kind of like fades away into the fog. Yes, right. I love I'm that. I'm printing picture. that next. I love that picture, and I could almost see that. Like you know, like like two different versions of that print. Like you ever see the ones where they print that on glass? I have not. Oh, like I could totally see that on this kind of glass. I've seen some of these 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 prints when people are printing this stuff on glass, and there's services you can do that like that. And the other one, I can't remember what it's called, but it's like a it's a print that has like a silver in it. You know what I'm talking about? I do not know. There's a, I, I, it's a special, I don't know if it's a special paper or process or something like that. I know that there's aluminum they're printing on. Yeah. It's aluminum not, sheets. Yeah. No, nah, this, this is different than that. This is something in terms of, so it's actually still printed on paper, <coughs> but it has like a kind of like a metallic thing to, I can't, I don't know what it is. Like well, I said, like, I'm, so I just, my, the prints I'm going to be selling in 10 by 10 are on metallic luster paper. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, so I, I put out the extra money, um, to do that. Uh, simply just reading up on it. It's a black. And, these are going to be black and white photos that I'm putting out there. I also want to do some color photos, but uh, the ones I'm doing now are black and white because it was a snowstorm and the bridge is black. Um, yeah, it's a very high contrasty paper. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's just like a metallic luster uh, paper, and I'm really interested to see how this comes out and looks. Nice, man. Because I, I I really want to like put these on. I, I'm going to put these on a foam core. And then try to either get some of these framed or um, sell them as is on the foam board and allow the people to find the frame that they want. There you go, man. There you go. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, there you have it. So we'll be looking for um, seeing some uh, of Sean's prints, which I'm very excited about. Um, in space news tonight, um, I'm just going to kind of like, like sketch on a couple of these. I think I want to come back to this Elon Musk story, um, about some of the kind of working conditions in Tesla. Um, I'm not going to go into it too much now just because I think it will, um, I know I will go off on a bunch of tangents on this one and, um, there's a lot to it. I don't want to do a disservice, but, um, there's been an ongoing, the short version of it is that been ongoing efforts to begin to unionize uh, some of Tesla's factories. And there's been um, a whole bunch of increases in injuries, um, especially as the production pressures um, increase about the Tesla 3. Um, and there's a, a great story that came out in the uh, Daily Beast a couple days ago, I guess, um, about this. But maybe we'll, kind of, we'll leave that for next week when we've got a little bit more time. Um <clears throat> The one fun thing for tonight on Space News is Jeff Bezos, right? Like I said at the onset, saves the expanse. The expanse will continue. We will see the next round of the expanse. I was very excited about that, right? <clears throat> but what was weird about it was that um, he basically, you know, there was speculation about this. We talked about this last week. Um, but uh, what was weird about this is that he says he's going to save the expanse and the cast of the expanse is in the audience. And they're all clapping. Woo. He does this. And then he starts to lay out some of the plans of establishing a moon base. Right. Um, so uh, Jeff Bezos, man, um, here's what I was thinking about this today. Right. I could see these arguments that get, that, that get, that played itself out as like, well, look, you've got all these. And look, Jacobin did a great piece on this about how the future of these kind of like multi-billionaires or whatever like this. And they're projecting their own kind of into the future by kind of wanting to colonize Mars or wanting to colonize the moon and all this other kinds of stuff. And there's real truth to that. Right. And I can hear some of the echoes. That, and you're going to hear me in a second. We'll talk about Wilbur Ross's statements um, this week. But um, there are some real echoes about, you know, look. We need, this is why we have to allow these people to accumulate as much wealth as possible so that we can do these things, right? Because without them, we would not be going to Mars. We would not be going back to the moon. We don't have this space, blah, 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 right? And, you know, I was thinking about this today. I was kind of running a bunch of errands, and I was, you know, I was thinking about this in my head, and I was like, you know, it didn't have to be that way. Right. Let's say that as a society, we think this is kind of interesting stuff. Right. We think that kind of actually um, being able to study, even if purely scientific purposes. Right. Which when you say when you say words like that, purely scientific purposes, that means it is not profitable. Right. At least in the short term. 
um, so that governments generally do this. Right? We could have made a decision to actually do these things, right? Go to Mars, right? Kind of like establish a moon base and all this. That would have been a collaborative and collective decision, right? But instead, what we're doing is we're handing it over to privateers, right? We're handing it over to like people who are looking for making tons of money. So when Jeff Bezos says that I want to establish a moon base, right? And we've got a government that says, yeah. Jeff Bezos, that was your moon base. Basically, what we're saying is that we are going to fund the moon base on the backs, right, of workers getting paid minimum wage in Amazon factories and Am factories, Amazon warehouses across the country. Right? That's what that means. <clears throat> Doesn't have to be that way. So we've got a couple different kinds of debates going on here. One, is this kind of space exploration even valuable, right? And I think that that is an important discussion that we've got to have, right? Um, and there's, I even have mixed, very mixed feelings on this as much as kind of like, you know, I get the stars in the eyes about this stuff. Um, but on the other hand, it's like the question of how, how do we do this? Do we hand this all over to the private sector, the galactic capitalists who are about to like launch us into like, I'm telling you people we're about to launch us into like a future that is not glorious, right? Watch the expanse and think Jeff Bezos is the bad guy in this show. <laughs> OK, like Elon Musk is the bad guy in this show. They're the corporate people in this show. Um, that's the irony of this whole thing. But anyways, so there's that. So you put that in context. And this week, um, Wilbur Ross, of all people, right, the Commerce, Sec uh, the Commerce Secretary, Wilbur Ross, um, as we've talked about before um, on this show, um, he has basically said that the uh, moon is here future the uh, the moon base is going to be here more uh, quicker than you think okay and this was like published on whitehouse.gov so not just kind of rando publication here and i just want to kind of leave you with some of the, the like i don't know the best of and some of the statement that was released from Wilbur ross so i'm going to skip through this right so each thing i'm going to about to read is going to be a quote from the article but it's going to be skipping through different parts of it okay so here we go the future for American commercial space activity is bright. Space entrepreneurs are already planning travel to Mars, and they are looking to the moon as the perfect location for a way station to refuel and restock Mars-bound rockets. Okay? As much as this sounds like the plot of 2001, A Space Odyssey, it's coming closer to reality and sooner than you ever had thought possible. A privately funded American space industry is the reason. You see that shift there? The privately funded American space industry is the reason. The reason why these people have so much money to begin with, this is, I, I'm, I'm editorializing here. The, the reason why these people have that kind of accumulated money is be because of deregulation and the past 40 years of neoliberal economics, right, that has basically pushed all this money into the hands of the private sector. So let me just say that. So back to the article. A privately funded American space industry is the reason. This industry is making progress in leaps and bounds. The global space economy is approaching a $350 billion and is expected to become a multi-trillion dollar industry. You got that? A multi-trillion dollar industry. And this is why we need to pay attention to this stuff. Skipping down. Space tourism is maybe only a year away. I don't know if you saw this past week, Virgin Atlantic. They, this is, again, me editorializing. Virgin Atlantic kind of launched out uh, kind of one of their kind of space tourist planes that is kind of a low Earth orbit, orbit um, kind of like a near space orbit, I think is what they call it. Um, they finally, they did another like, full round of testing of it um, that was kind of, um, they changed the specs of this plane so that it would uh, account for people sitting in the plane and things like this. So they're kind of getting closer the space tourism. So now back to the article. Tickets for human flights to lower Earth orbit um, have already sold for, are you ready? $250,000 a piece. And you don't get those on Ticketmaster, folks. Skipping down. Competition is already fierce, with Russia and China challenging the United States for leadership. Here's your bring in the fear factor. And about 70 other countries working their way into space. But today's space race is different. 
that is driven by innovative companies that are finding new solutions to get to space faster, cheaper, and more effectively. As these companies advance new ideas for space commerce and non-traditional approaches to space travel, they seek the legitimacy and stability that comes with government support and approval. And here you go. They yearn for a government that acts as a facilitator, not just a regulator. Government must create frameworks that enable rather than stifle industry. Recognize the playbook, people. This is it. This is coming from Wilbur Ross. So this is the kind of thing when I look out and I see this is kind of like my children as adults and my grandchildren are going to feel the effects of what is happening right now. Because we already have the massive accumulation of wealth in the hands of people like Jeff Bezos, the richest man in the world, right? And that is going to determine how we go into space. And if we go into space as nothing but profit extractivism moving forward, we are screwed, right? Um, so Wilbur Ross is someone to be pay, pay, paying attention to. And like, you know what? This stuff, space policy stuff, is not exactly sexy stuff. Doesn't make it to MSNBC's Russia, Russia, Russia coverage, right? Um, but this is the kind of thing that, you know, we're talking generations look forward. Mark my words, people. This is the moment that we get to set the challenge. We get, I mean, we get to set the, the context. We get to set the terms of the way this happens, right? So that is my space industry talk for the night um, with Wilbur Ross. Sean has given me the, come on, man, I want to go to a freaking bed look. So uh, it's about that time. Right. Yeah, I hit the wall. Yeah, Sean <laughs> hit the wall. All right. So a couple quick things, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lead over to Sean to kind of uh, take us out on a down note. Um, so, <laughs> so uh, but an important, a down note, but an important note. Uh, did my space needs, but here, first of all, Free Will just um, um, had a new can release yesterday. It's called a Judo Financing. It's a New England style IPA with key limes. Comes in at seven, uh, or, or sorry, six point nine percent alcohol. Um, but let me tell you this: it's fantastic. And um, they put this in cans. They were not. Um, they they didn't set out to put this in cans. They had it only on tap um, um, at in Percocy, um, uh, like in Percocy and their other thing. Well, I can't remember the name of the place. Whatever the hell is another place. They, they have two locations. What what are here in Percocy? They had it on tap, and people loved it. And they kind of basically said, man, you guys should put this in cans. Please put this in cans. Please put this in cans. Well, they did, and it's fantastic. Um, they've got kind of stock stuff. It's going to be plenty out there to kind of go get some there. So while I was there picking up this earlier today, I was picking up my cans uh, for judo financing, I did not realize that they had done another kind of whole other round of, of canning this week. Um, and so now they've got Micromanager um, in cans, um, which is phenomenal. I mean, Micromanager um, is great. They've got it. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, Micromanager is there. They also have this other one called Miscommunication. Uh, Miscommunication is a New England style farmhouse IPA. Um, and it's great. Um, it's a little, it comes in a little bit on the uptick, comes out on 7.5%. Um, but man, it's really, really good. It's got this nice dry tinge to it, nice and cloudy. Um, the one that really surprised me, though, I have to say, did not expect this at all. Um, they have a their house pilsner called uh, Duct Tape and Zip Ties. Never had it before. Um, I've always been a little bit reluctant to kind of get pilsners um, from local breweries, not just not Free Will, but anywhere I go, um, in part because, you know, I had this experience. I, I studied in Germany for a while, and I had, like, pilsners that were fresh from the tap, and they were just unbelievable, right? They were fantastic sitting out in summer days drinking Pilsners, and they had this, 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 this sense to them that were just, yes, this is the way it's supposed to taste. And I've always been a little bit let down by Pilsners here. This duct tape um, and zip ties is fantastic. It is a fantastic Pilsner. And I said to Sean before the show tonight is that when I tasted that for the first time, I was like, holy crap. I said, this thing... That literally, I had a flashback to when I was in Germany drinking Pilsners. Um, so, man, huge kudos to Free Will for putting that out. Um, and it's called Duct Tape and Zip Ties. Um, I'd encourage you to get out there and get some this weekend. All right. So, uh, Sean, so as I'm urging people to go out and buy beer, um, you've got this little thing that came from uh, the Hill Farmstead owner, Sean Hill. 
um, the little interview he did this past week. Yes, uh, there was a uh, Brewers conference over somewhere in Europe over the weekend or last week. Uh, Sean Hill, owner of Hill Farmstead, founder of Hill Farmstead, started a brewery on his ancestral like grounds in Vermont. Uh, re- one of the best breweries in the world uh, makes very clean, true to style beers. Uh, he went on the record in an hour long interview, like a 10 minute section, probably uh, about alcohol issues and mental health issues uh, within the craft beer industry with brewers and owners being drunk all the time uh, because of the access they have to beer. And he got a lot of pushback uh, from the beer community, from his friends, because uh, the journalist decided to uh, focus his whole entire 800 word story basically on the issues that the issues, the stresses of owning a brewery and the drinking and the rampant alcoholism that comes within the beer scene. Um, it kind of pissed off his friends because he called all his friends, yeah, we're all a bunch of drunks who have health, me- mental health issues at times. And uh, he, um, after he got a lot of pushback from his friends, uh, he started backpedaling. He wrote a response saying, you know, this is unfair. I did an hour long interview and that the journalist decided to uh, just write a story based on this like section of the interview. Which, uh, yeah, that's how journalism works. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> and we decided, decided to tweet at him and basically say, uh, yeah, this is how journalism works. And if you have a problem with it, just say this is off the record next time. This is pretty simple. Or I'm not comfortable talking about this on the record. Well, and you know- the journalist will honor your privileges of keeping that off the record. Right. But, you know, one of the other things about this, though, is that, you know, it kind of bums me out a bit that this guy um, kind of caved um, to he some of that pressure. Quickly. Well, and, 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 you know, it, it, that's that bums me out because it's like, look, is that... And he decided to start, like, tweeting back at me on Twitter. Oh, that's nice. And I said, yeah, listen, like, I am a... He said, he said I think you're miss, missing the point. And I responded, like, no, I'm not missing the point. I only have press credentials in one of the most important state capitals in the country right now, covering politics and knowing how to interview people. If like someone says something's off the record, it's off the record. If you say it and it's, you don't specify it, then it's on the record. And I also said, you know, like Jesus, just don't run for office because you'll just get destroyed by people one day. Right. I'm pretty much calling him a snowflake. Right. But you know, but the more important issue here, right. Is that, you know, that he backs away from this and makes about an issue that was not there. And I think, look, the journalist in this case um, did a pretty good job of kind of like, whoa, say, this is actually an important story, right? Because you, you could imagine when you're interviewing people that are kind of like, you know, important in like any industry, right? A lot of what the story is going to be, a lot of what the interview is going to be, is it going to be a he story about... the fluff piece to be written. Right. No, exact, that's exactly what most of those things are. Right. And that's fine. But the fact is, he actually came forward and actually said, you know, talked about this stuff, which people don't write about. Right. You know, like I mean, last week on the show, we and talked about we talked about wait, 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 last, last week on the show. We talked about how we you know about the labor issue. Right. About the fact about, you know, what's happening in terms of like kind of labor equity, um, like in the craft brew industry. And here you got, you know, kind of Sean Hill coming out and say, saying, look, look, you know. This is a big issue, too, as well, the alcoholism and the kind of the mental health issues and things like this. And it's like, you know, it's so telling to me that we can't just talk about these issues and not say it has to be either or. We can love craft beer and say, look, you know, we've got to be concerned, too, as well, about what's what, you know, when people start when the industry starts becoming, you know, um, a, 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 a kind of like a crucible for um like destruction you know alcoholism and all this mental health issues this kind of stuff that's an okay to talk about right if you want to have a sustainable industry just like it's okay to talk about like um wages but sorry to mean and to it's cut also you off. uh one of the things like we you know drinking in this country uh some of the biggest it's like gun ownership it's a small amount of people who drive the industry within alcohol you know the right. alcohol industry it's a heavily concentrated industry of people drinking 10 or 15 drinks a day. It represents like a large disproportionate share of the overall beer and liquor uh, industry. 
who drive the profits uh, for that. And it's just, yeah, I mean, no, he backpedaled real quickly <laughs> after his friends were like, yo, what the fuck? Yeah. Don't tell everybody that, like, our stuff hurts people. Right. <clears throat> And it's so, you know, it's, I, don't, I, don't, I never know what to do with that kind of dynamic. Like, it's like, you know, look. And it's also like you're bitching at someone who gave you an interview and you're upset because they didn't report on the whole interview. Like, yeah, I mean, if like 45 minutes of an interview is all fluff and then the industry leader's like, yeah, by the way, we're all alcoholics and suffering from depression for 15 minutes and the stresses that come with that. Yeah, that's the story. You're the brewer of one of the most world-renowned renowned breweries, and like you're upset. At, like you're yeah, and then you just go out and go scorch earth against journalists for actually doing their job. You know what? I'd love to see that journalist do. I'd love to see that journalist go to Sean uh, to Sean Hill and basically say, "Okay, look, all right, maybe we got this one wrong. So here's the deal. I'll write." your glowing fluff piece about everything that you do if you give me an interview that is focused specifically on alcohol abuse and mental health issues in the industry. There's your deal. Take it or leave it. I mean, that'd be great. And then when Sean Hill says, no, not going to take it, then you write a story about that. (laughs) Right? I mean... Crazy. And there were local people in the beer industry, uh, local beer scene out here in Harrisburg, who were defending Sean Hill, uh, basically saying he got screwed over by the journalist. And like, sorry, the job of the journalist is to write the story that appears in an interview, not write, not summarize the whole entire interview. No, you look for the story. Yeah, I, I get it. I get it. Anyway, so there you have it. So, folks, you'll see uh, some links to that, and you'll get to see kind of a bunch of fun stuff and all that kind of thing. Um, like I said, and, and Sean is is uh, is has hit the wall, and uh, he is uh, visibly on. Like I can see him right now, and he's uh, already got half his head in bed. <laughs> you can see it in his eyes. He's like not like figuratively, not literally. This is figuratively. You see, I'm like, I'm looking, I'm shutting down my computer already. I'm like clicking off things right now. I want to go to bed. <laughs> All right. So anything else for the good of the order, Sean? That is it. All right. So we have no idea how this thing is going to turn out. Um, so uh, we'll see if you like this free willing, free, free willing, uh, free wheeling kind of Thursday, Thursday things. Let us know. I'll break this out in segments so that you'll have the, uh, you don't have to listen to everything if you don't want to. Um, but uh, there you go. But anyways, this is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. I want to remind you that um, the best way that you can support Whole No Punch's progressive media, homegrown right here in Pennsylvania, is become a member of Raging Chicken Press for as little five bucks a month. Let's go to patreon.com, that's RC Press, and you'll be on your way. This is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. We'll talk to you next week. For now, we're signing out. See ya! Mighty, mighty union. Everywhere we go. Everywhere we go. People wanna know. People wanna know. Who we are. Who we are. So we tell them. So we tell them. We are the union. We are the union. The